The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 12 of the Cinematography Podcast. Episode 12. Hi, I'm Ben Rock. And I'm Ilya Friedman. And we're sorry that these take so goddamn long, but that's how we are. Yeah, we we are consistently sorry, but... Yeah, I, I sort of feel like we should probably change the title to the I'm sorry it's taken us three months to release this episode cinematography podcast. The highly infrequent cinematog- cinematography <laughs> podcast. And maybe we should put a, a just like a pitch out there right now. Like, are you, If you are have minor skills as like an audio editor and you want to intern for the cinematography podcast, should we take like resumes or something? I'd be happy to take resumes because I could easily shoot somebody an MP3 file of our giant long ass interviews and they could uh, chop away all day long i love that idea so if you're listening to this and you would like to edit an episode or more than one episode of the cinematography podcast please send an email to <laughs> email at camnoir.com that wasn't even planned but it sounds planned it totally sounds planned now because we're not pros but we're something we, we impersonate professionals <laughs> we're professional something else's <laughs> all right so Ilya, you just got back from napty now what the hell is NAPTI? Uh, NAPTI is the National Association of Television Program Executives. And uh, that's a really wordy way of saying it's basically the biggest convention in the country where people go to buy and sell television series. Now, and, and by the way, it should be noted, you just got back from NAPTI, what, yesterday, today? Yeah, something like that. And tomorrow you're going to Sundance. That's right. I had yesterday and today to basically get some work done and then off to the next thing. So anyway, NAPP is uh, is really, really interesting. Uh, it is a very professional organization. And I would say that unlike some of the other industry conventions and things that go on, a la NAB, things like that, this is very high level people, lots of executives, not a lot of looky-loos, not a lot of sort of like uh, weird hangers on and wannabes although you know there there is always a, a little bit of an element of that where is it held uh it moves around but it was held this year in miami and i believe it was actually last year as well in miami miami seems to be um seems to be a really i think that nat p has an office in miami mm-hmm. and so it's very easy for them and i have to say that miami every time i go there feels like it's becoming a little bit more like las vegas the only thing missing is like gambling it's like miami is these resort hotels oh. that are all you know opulent and over the top and it's very well if, if depending on when you go to vegas it's very warm it's like <laughs> it's a, there, there's a lot of like gaudiness and I, I have relatives in miami and every time i go there i kind of walk away with the same feeling and that's that miami exists so so that i can have a snappy retort when people say that la is full of the most phony people they've ever met <laughs> no offense miamians i was born in miami <laughs> you know uh i guess i don't, I don't hate miami but well, i don't hate miami but it's like it's really interesting for me just i mean you can get a hell of a of a schmear there i mean like the, the bagels <laughs> the best <laughs> It seems to me like Cuban food. That's the place to go for Cuban food. Oh, well, Cuban everything. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, so, yeah, Cuban everything. But, you know, Miami International Airport, not the best airport. You know, it's Mm -hmm. anyway. But so I'm getting way far afield here. Nat is um, is really sort of taking and handling this whole... Boy, there's there's so much lingo. There's so much industry lingo that's going on. Like SVOD, you ever heard SVOD before? Yes, that would be streaming video on demand. That's exactly right. So the whole... uh, confluence of SVOD and traditional linear television, which they're calling now broadcast television is linear television. It is. Yeah. Linear television. So, okay. Um, if you say so. And, uh, it's, it's really interesting though. They're handling this, this confluence and they're handling, um, what all the different markets and distribution strategies can be for multiple platforms. And by platforms, I'm talking like Apple TV and uh, PlayStations and uh, Netflixes and Hulus and all of these different ways in which you as a consumer would buy or watch something, including like, you know, uh, Horace and Pete, like the new uh, yeah. Louis C.K. series where you go directly to the website or now available on Hulu. But the, the conversations have a lot to do with like, how are people getting paid from primary and ancillary markets? Is, you know, and and how long is, how long until unions get heavily involved in that question, too? It's, it's a good question. There, basically, there's there's a lot of discussion with that sort of thing happening. And there's also some education like master classes. And there's also like 
people there buying and selling shows. There's a whole marketplace and people. So there are people who are making independent shows like they're going out the way you would make an independent movie, raising money, making a TV series and then taking it to nappy. Exactly. And there are people who uh, just have ideas. They don't have a sizzle reel. They don't haven't produced anything. And it's not just little independents. There are big companies there, too, who are both buying and selling. And I met a really cool guy actually on the airplane on the way there, also going to nappy. And we talked pretty much the whole way. And he is an aggregator and not a sales agent. He will like a sales agent, like is certainly in the feature world, they help you get your movie sold and they get a percentage of like the proceeds. They, they, they handle a transaction for you yeah. as an aggregator. He is actually buying the content and reselling it to somebody else. He, so yeah, he is essentially truly, truly serving as a middleman, but it's not just in a, um, it's not just like, Hey, I'm brokering this deal. He's like, I've bought all of the rights to what you've produced and I'm going right over here to this other person who I know wants something like this and selling them. And when I ran into him, like on day two, I was like, man, you look like you're in a good mood. And he's like, I just bought and sold the series. And I was like, wow, congratulations. Cause That's I'm cool. sure he bought it low and sold it high. So, well, and even at, I mean, this is a slight, uh, sidetrack, but on uh, 20 seconds to live, We've encountered several people who are doing that with web series. So it's like completely independently produced web series made by anyone. And there are companies like there's one in Europe called Roxeline that that approached us and we ultimately didn't go with them. But um, but they have a pretty interesting uh, plan about how they're how they're able to take a web series out to market and be able to get you some kind of return on your investment. And it, I'm really glad that you bring that up because the whole idea of web series was really big conversation. In fact, some of the most oh, was well, it? well attended portions hmm. of Natpe, uh, there was an executive from YouTube who was there talking about this and really the whole idea of web series being sort of like the minor leagues for for major television and other sorts of svod and other platforms and services is very prevalent but also there are people saying you know you know squash all that it's not about the minor leagues this is actually now first run primary and if they're they're creating content that's appropriate there are these what they're calling digital studios that have popped up And that is their whole plan. They are producing content and sometimes they're owned by large uh, nonfiction reality style companies. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they're not, sometimes they're independent, but they have investment, they have dollars and they are nurturing and producing content and and bringing new talent into the space. And it's not just YouTube creators and social media stars. Really, they're they're looking at it as a a platform to deliver content. A lot of it is short form, but some of it's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and that's one of the things that I've kind of learned in the last year going to uh, WebFest with 20 Seconds to Live is that there's actually a lot of actually really slick, well done work being done in that in that space. Some of it shockingly so, and some obviously some, there's some money to be had in it. Uh, I met uh, I met one gentleman who made a web series, had a lot of success, sold it, and is now trying to make is trying to duplicate that. But yeah, like he was telling me, and and actually I should mention this that I recorded a lot of this, and mm-hmm. so I will probably cut one or more podcast episodes for the cinematography podcast all about napty with these sound bites and interviews that i did fascinating so something for people to look forward to yeah we'll have a little nap p wrap up probably sometime after sundance just gauging on the way and also we'll have a a, we'll we'll hopefully do our sundance wrap up that we have at least once before done yes uh we've done sundance twice and i think that we might as well it's sort of like the thing at the beginning of the year it kind of kicks off everything we should do that yeah it's like post sundance pre nab you know it's like a couple of months before nab and uh, everything's about to the whole the whole freaking kitten caboodle is about to change again every nab god and i feel like the first part of the year there's so much stuff loaded in here too we've got uh asc awards coming up then there's south by there's a lot of things sort of in this first part of the year yep who do we got on the show today uh we have tony libertori on the show today i'm so excited we got tony libertori on the show tony is i I said that like i don't know like i didn't conduct the fucking interview yeah and isn't tony like within like five square miles of you or something like isn't he like no no, tony is within like a quarter mile of here he lives in my neighborhood I could walk, I could literally walk to, I, no, it's not that I could literally walk to his house. I regularly walk to his house. And even when I walk my dogs, I walk them past his house, which is kind of how I got to meet him. Now I'm envisioning you like in your slippers, walking your two giant dogs through the neighborhood. Is that pretty much how it goes? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I pretty much always wear black boots no matter what I'm doing. That's funny. I pretty much always wear black boots, too. Yes. <laughs> and therein ends all commonality between Ben and I. <laughs> <laughs> we're both both lapsed Jews. Anyway, um, 
<laughs> so uh, Tony Libertori, uh, I, who, who I met while walking dogs through my neighborhood, is uh, one of the most amazing storyboard artists working in the business today. And he talks about a lot of really cool stuff, like uh, how he did the storyboards, which opened the movie Argo, uh, working on the Fast and Furious franchise, working on uh, Marvel, big Marvel movies like Captain America Civil War. Yeah, you don't know it, but you've seen Tony's work. I mean, like people listening to this show right now have seen Tony's work. They've seen it all over the place and had no idea who, who it was. Yeah. And one of the things that I, I think is very interesting and elucidating to me, and honestly, I've learned uh, through knowing Tony, I've known Tony probably for about six or seven years now, is that, you know, there's kind of a misconception of what a storyboard artist does. A story Like I had always imagined, like, you know, you're a storyboard artist, you're, you're a good artist. You sit in the room with George Lucas. He says, OK, now I want a medium shot of C-3PO walking down the hallway. OK, now I want a close up of his hand on the doorknob. There aren't doorknobs no. really, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's like uh, storyboard artists, and this is very common, they go off and create sequences. Like they're given kind of a general direction, and then and then the directors give them, you know, drill down and get more and more specific. It's a little bit like the way animation goes. Yeah, my, my buddy John Fox is a uh, storyboard artist, and he's done a lot of big movies too, and he'll tell me, and I, th- I think this is true of every storyboard artist, like especially there's, there's scenes that sometimes... I think that maybe they think of it as a throwaway scene or maybe it's like a big action scene, but it's like conceptually the storyboard artist is coming up with how this scene is going to play out. They're coming up with the concept and they create these boards, highly detailed boards. And sometimes the creatives don't change a thing. They, they shoot it exactly as it's done on this, on the boards. I mean, and that's why they do it. I I worked on a project that I'm not really allowed to say what it was. (laughs) dark tower um, <laughs> about six years ago and it's not the version of the dark tower that got made and um and we boarded and i built an animatic of the entire movie and so we we had uh tony was actually one of the artists on that um and we had a guy named trevor goring and a guy named tom nelson and uh all of them they, they would farm different kinds of sequences out to each one of them based on what their specific strengths were but we would literally meet up with uh, Ron Howard and the executive producers every few weeks and kind of go over stuff and get notes and go redo stuff. But it was it was uh, that was that was a huge learning experience. And it was the first thing that I ever worked with Tony on. It sounds like a pretty cool job too, Stephen King, all that stuff. So. Oh, it was it was completely badass, and I'm I'm bummed out that that version didn't get made. But um, having seen what what they have released of the new one, I think you know the the movie version of the Dark Tower as it's about to come out looks pretty badass to me. Ron Howard seems to be quite busy. I just heard about this Beatles documentary oh, yeah. thing. That's sick. Yeah, that's a that's a lot yeah, of buzz around that. That guy doesn't like to stop working. I, I really admire his ethic. He's he's uh he's he's a good egg. He's also like probably one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Uh, I I've I've heard that. My mm-hmm. uh uh my wife, who you know, uh produced one of those E True Hollywood stories on the Andy Griffith show, and of course Ron Howard early on, but uh she got to she got to interview uh, Ron's father and said that, you know, it's like, you know, the, the apple can't have fallen that far from the tree. Like one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, a lot of people uh, at that level, I think, tend to be pretty cool, especially people who are very confident and know, know how good they are at what they do. They didn't really need to prove it to anybody. Did I say egg fall from the tree or apple fall from the tree? I thought you said apple. Okay, maybe I did say apple. I think I said he was a good egg. You said good egg, but it, you know, it's that dyslexia thing I've got going on. So, without further ado, here is Tony Liberatore. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I don't think people understand what a storyboard artist does. Right. I think that I, I, the older I get, the more I have an axe to grind against auteur theory which is that like all the ideas come from the director right um and i think that you know like many of the movies that we love that you know the big star wars kind of movies or whatever the movies that we all grew up on you know like these are movies that were heavily whatever the storyboarding or pre-visualization of their time was it doesn't matter if it was lawrence of arabia or you know, whatever they were heavily thought through beforehand. And I think that a lot of times we think the director comes up with every shot. Right. Tell me like, what was it? You were an artist when you started, what made you specifically interested in storyboards and what was kind of your path to even becoming an artist? Just tell me about sort of your background before you even got into it. I've been drawing since as long as I can remember. I remember being about I, maybe four years old. Uh, I remember like sitting down on my grandfather's lap. And it's going to sound like a weird story, but 
Um, it depends on where you take it from. <laughs> I was sitting in my grandfather's lap and, Uh-oh. um, in the margin of the, uh, newspaper, um, he would sit there, you know, uh, drawing stuff for me. And, uh, I remember I took the pen from him or the pencil and I started drawing, uh, we were drawing these little choo-choo trains and I started drawing the train on the paper and it ended up looking like better than what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, he looked over at my parents. He's like, Hey, we better get this kid some drawing lessons. You know, he's got some talent. Uh-huh. Um, so that was like my earliest memories of actually like drawing. And after that, I started getting into, you know, like life drawing classes at a really, really young age. Um, like how old? Maybe at about six years old. Oh, that is young. Yeah. The instructor was really hesitant on bringing me on. He said he didn't normally even like to work with kids, Mm -hmm. but he was looking at the stuff that I was doing and decided to take a chance on me. So he brought me into the class and I remember it was mostly adults and, uh, you know, people in there like taking their clothes off and drawing. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, I'm Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, ever since that point on, I've just been doing nothing but drawing, but then you know, I was a big anime fan when I was a kid. Speed Racer, Thundercats, Transformers, and things like that. I was like, hey, I want to make a cartoon, and I want to put it on the air. I mean, it didn't occur to me that that was something that was, like, impossible to do. Especially and, for, and how old are you at this point? Uh, Maybe about eight. Okay. So I was, like, in third grade, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make a cartoon. And I told my dad, and who's – my dad was always really supportive of everything that I've done. So when I walked up to him and, and gave him this absurd statement, hey, I want to make a cartoon, and they're going to put it on TV. And he's like, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll help you. He, he ordered some uh, animation supplies um, from this weird city called Culver City, California. And, oh, and, sound, sounds exotic. Yeah, and I get this uh, – this envelope from them and it's got all these like um animation cells in it and pens and all the stuff that my dad ordered for me and that's I'm not like, fucking around no yeah. was your was your father into the arts in any way he he's he was artistic he played like the french horn and so did my dad plays the french horn really whoa weird that's odd but he was artistic in the sense that like when we would sit down and draw or color in a coloring book when i was coloring something red he'd be like you know that's not just red there's a little bit of orange in there and there's a little bit of green and there's a little bit of brown. There's a little bit of purple. And I, you know, he really taught me how to look at things differently. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I'm like, okay, well this guy's skin is this color, but the shadow is like purplish looking. So I'll put this in here. And you know, so all my coloring books now had like three dimensionality (laughs) to them that, you know, none, none of the other kids had. And then ultimately you rebelled against him by going into a drawing form. That's mostly black and white. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's a whole other story. (laughs) From that point on, I was just totally lost in my own mind, like daydreaming all the time. I did pretty poorly in school because I couldn't just stop sitting in class thinking about scenes to draw and things like that. And I would just be sketching all the time in class. And then when I'm trying to put this animation show together, I'm like writing a premise for it. I'm like doing this like I'm typing on my computer (laughs) before there are even computers. Um, But I got this. Back then you were chiseling into a (laughs) stone wall. (laughs) So I get this whole premise together and I'm like, well, I, I guess I should start with the intro of the show because those, the intros of all those anime shows from the eighties are like, you know, you could tell they put all that work into the intro, like Thunder mm-hmm. Cats or Silver Hawks. They only got to do that once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the rest of the show looked like shit, but those yeah. <laughs> intros were so slick and, and cool. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start with that. So it just was like <laughs> a logical thing for me to sit down and... I didn't know what storyboards were at the time, but it was like, I need to sit down and plan out the sequence as to how they would look in a series of shots. Yeah. So that was like the first time I actually really storyboarded something without even knowing that I was actually what, what the term was or what it, Mm. what it even meant. Do you still have any of these boards? No, I looked for them. Um, but I, they got lost somewhere. I had them in like a little file folder and held onto them for the longest time. But I think when I uh, moved out of my parents' house, some, I think either my mom maybe threw them away. Oh, no. Yeah. I like lots of cool character designs in them on notebook paper, you know, uh. on spiral down notebook paper. And, but, yeah, they're I think they're lost now. I mean, it sounds like you got into drawing as like a serious discipline almost immediately. Yeah, pretty much. It's been there from pretty much the beginning as far as I can remember. It's it's, a, it's as much a part of me as any experience I've ever had in life. It's it's. It's to the point where if I'm having like a bad day, if I, you know, or somebody might have a drink or something like that to calm their nerves. If I sit down and I draw, for some reason, my nerves settle and it's like, everything's going to be okay. 
Yeah, because you because you start focusing on your drawing subject and you're not focusing on your problems. Right, and it's to the point now where you know I'm so far along, I guess, in my career that I know that as long as I keep my drawing in order and I know you know I keep my skills my skill set up and frosty, if you will, <laughs> um, the idea of like bills or things like that or responsibilities kind of fall to the to the side because I know everything's gonna yeah. be all right as long as I'm drawing good. <laughs> Well, that makes sense or not. I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, the fact that you've been doing this since you're, you know, since you're under 10 years old with some, you know, in, intention behind it. A lot of times filmmakers, even people who are relatively advanced in it will say like, do you know any good software for storyboarding? And I'll be and I'm like, I know the best <laughs> the best software. It's called learn how to draw. Yeah. <laughs> like Learn how to draw. It'll take you 10 years, but then you'll be you'll be uh, that'll be great. So do you go through a period where you want to do comic books? When do you realize that storyboarding uh, movies is, is a direction that you could go in? Storyboards cover so many different things. And I got my foot in the door in the commercial part of boards or the advertising part of it. So getting into actually doing films was always the, the main goal. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that commercials were storyboarded or the storyboarding process that goes on behind the commercials with the advertising agencies. Oh my you know, God. Yeah. And, and, uh, even print ads and things like that. But before you get to that, did you stay on the path of you wanted to do like your own anime kind of shows? I, I do think that this industry is full of people who are uh, monomaniacal and focused on a goal and move towards that goal their whole lives. And some of them get there and some right. don't. Uh, but were you moving towards that or did you ha go through a period where you were like, uh, you know, I'm going to go draw Batman comics or something. No, I don't think I ever really knew that I was going to go in in any certain direction. I mean, th the thought of making comic books was appealing. I mean, I was a big comic book fan, but I never really thought that I'd be able to actually draw or do any of that for a living. Really? Yeah. I mean, even when I went to college, I remember my one of my illustration professors telling me, you're never going to be able to make money drawing, ever. What? Yeah. So what you want to do is get your master's degree in teaching and then you can come to school like me and you can teach me uh, how to draw. And I was like, well, that's fucking depressing. That's horrible. Yeah. So I started switching my sights. I knew I wanted to stay in the art world. So I was thinking about maybe becoming like a, one of those museum curator type guys <laughs> that goes around and knows everything about what's in the museum <laughs> and you know, takes care of it and all that shit. Where, where did you go to college? I was running a business in New York and uh, my business was doing pretty well. So I was able to kind of step away from it. And I started taking some night school classes at college in Long Island in New York, uh, just a community college. Dare I ask what kind of business? Uh, we were like wholesaling kitchenware and stuff like that. So this is your own business? Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, not necessarily to take us off on that track, but you spent a certain number, a certain amount of time, years or whatever, getting that business going. Yeah, from like 19 to 25. Really? Yeah. Did you go to college at all or did you go to start college later? I enrolled in college and then stopped and then got going with this business and it was going pretty well. And then it just got to the point where it was like, I just didn't want to be partners with another person in business anymore because it mm -hmm. was like a marriage and it was just like, I just wasn't, you know, I, I put my whole heart into it. It was yeah, like yeah. six years of my life and... um. It was just at the end of the day, I was like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to work in the movies. Now, were you still drawing that whole time when you were doing that? I had just, like I was saying, I had a lot more free time on my hands because I was sitting in an office all day. So I started getting back to doing um, portrait drawings. I would go through these big uh, kind of coffee table books of uh, rock bands. Um, I love like rock photography. So I would see like, you know, uh, you two, uh, I would draw take mm -hmm. the black and white pictures and I would, you know, make a collage and just hand draw all these pictures and put them together in a composition that, you know, had never been seen before. I'm going to put all these pictures together or, um, you know, like, you know, pictures of like Led Zeppelin, you know, mm -hmm. like the most photogenic band that's ever existed. I'd be like, oh my God, I could just draw <laughs> this shit all day long. Um, <laughs> So then, you know, even my partner at the time, he was looking at my stuff and he, even he was like, he's like, what the fuck are you doing? It's like, you should be doing this for a living, you know? So, and at that point I didn't even want to, I didn't know what storyboards were at that point, but I did know, I thought what I wanted to do was go into the movie business. And I, what I really wanted to do is become a model maker because mm -hmm. I was like big into models, like world war two airplanes and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, 
I was very aware of that influence, like on the Star Wars movies or like Battlestar Galactica. You know, you I could see the World War II influences on on all those vehicle designs. And this is before CGI had taken over all of that, right? And I was already a kind of a big Sid Mead fan, so mm-hmm. I was like in love with the that kind of industrial design work that he. Who would is do. Sid Mead? I actually don't know who Sid Mead is. He he's the futurist that designed most of the stuff for uh, Blade Runner. Oh. Vehicle work for aliens. Sweet. There's a great documentary on uh, James Cameron where he was working. He was he was working with Mead, and they were discussing the design for the Nostromo. And Mead sent him this beautiful rendering, pen and ink rendering of what he thought the Nostromo should look like. It was this kind of sleek looking thing. And the Nostromo, that's the main ship in Alien. Yeah, that's a, that's the big the big ship that the uh, Marines come out of. Um, but then Cameron is like this genius and he's like well no the ship probably wouldn't look like that if it were just if, if it were going to be doing this for this specific purpose it would probably mm-hmm. be shaped more like this and this area would be bigger to accommodate more troops and this and that you know he was thinking like really technically Wait, is this for i'm sorry to, this is to, for aliens aliens so the oh i guess the nostromo is an alien yeah so he sends back sid mead a revised <laughs> Pen and ink drawing that's just as fucking good as me. Really? Is. And I had a whole new respect for Cameron after that point. A side trip about James Cameron. I always, what I have heard from everyone who's ever worked near the guy is that everybody on his crew knows that he could fire them and do their job better than they do it. Right. And I heard that same thing too, but I was like, whatever. He can't fucking draw. <laughs> and then they're like, well, you know who's drawing that picture of Kate Winslet in, um, Titanic. You oh know, yeah, the, those yeah. hands in the front. That, that's James Cameron. Yeah, that's that. that's if you if you watch it, you can you're like those aren't the hands yeah, of a those, twenty yeah. year old man. Those are like <laughs> those are old man hands. I say now that he's at the time younger than I am now. Right, but that that was the thing that really brought it home for me. I was like, well, maybe he is a fucking genius. You know, maybe yeah. he can do every every job. I, I think he is. Yeah, that's the area that I wanted to land in in movies was doing models or designing models. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like an industrial type of thing you know like vehicle design or stuff like that i mean you still kind of do sometimes right well yeah you kind of have to when you're in a situation where the art department hasn't come up with something or like in the case when i was working with uh david fincher there were no real designs for certain aspects of uh we were working on Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea and there was no real set design for um the nautilus let alone the hatchways, the hallways, yeah. how certain quarters looked. So I had to design a lot of that stuff because we're doing animatics. And, you know, the, the thing with animatics is in order to, to sell certain shots or whatever, you know, things have to move. Yeah, it's almost like making a primitive cartoon. I, yeah. s- I say this with with uh, mock uh, lack of knowledge, <laughs> No, 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 no. Actually, it's I, totally... I, I've dude, done a lot of animatics, though. So. Yeah, I look at mine, I'm like, God damn, this is pretty primitive looking. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, you have to have a basic understanding of how things move. Like, you know, you can't just make a door open. You know, it's yeah. got to be something that looks kind of like homogenous with the design of the ship and something that would operate, you know, that, that was like around the time of that. You know, like it would be like a hatch versus a door sliding yeah, or yeah. something like that. But at the same time, it had to have that kind of cool feel. So you have to have sort of a designer's mentality in you. I'm not saying that all storyboards have that. I've seen a lot of guys will just kind of. Yeah. phone it in and not really put too much thought into it which they really probably don't have to since they're just trying to get to the main story point but in that particular stage for that job it was like um, it was concepting just as much as there was storytelling yeah yeah and for that particular instance it was you know he liked the way i designed this hatchway door for example and he liked it so much that i had to go in and have a meeting with the art director and the art director's like you know when you you did this thing for me you're so happy you know, he wants us to redesign all these hatches to look the way you did it. And that's pretty sweet. So I'm sitting there like, okay, well, well it's high praise. I mean, I think that it's not an industry secret that David Fincher is very particular. Yeah, that is the case. So you're in your mid twenties, you go back to art school. Uh, you're, you're thinking about the film business. You're thinking about becoming a model maker. When is your first storyboard? When does it first occur to you that storyboarding is a thing you could do? Uh, well, when I was going to school, I was going to school during the day and I was working um, overnight at Walmart. I had the uh, 12 midnight to 8 in the morning shift stocking uh. shelves. So uh, it was the only shift that I could do to have like a full-time job and go to school. So one of the days I was up just kind of hanging out, I popped in the DVD of Gladiator. <laughs> um, and I saw it had an extra DVD in there and it said special features on it. 
So I put that in to check it out. I saw all these different menu things and one said storyboards and I clicked on it because it had like a little thumbnail drawing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting looking. So I clicked on it and I saw all these beautiful panels done by an artist named Sylvain Dupree. I hope I'm saying his name right. And he had done all these beautiful kind of keyframe illustrations of mostly of the tiger fight mm-hmm. at the very end. Between, yeah. Um, Maximus. Yes. Maximus Decimus Meridius or whatever. <laughs> I was like, wow, these are really beautiful. I was like, oh, I could fucking do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause they were so cartoony looking. And yeah, yeah. I was into drawing like, you know, hyper realistic portraiture. You yeah, know, yeah. Which I was really into at the time, you know, like really detailing stuff out to make it look like a 2D, you know, like a pencil drawing. Like, like if you, I have some stuff from college that if you look at it from a certain distance, it kind of looks like a photo. Mm-hmm. So I was oh, wow. really into that, you know, and I thought that I was the shit and I was looking at cartoony type of drawings. I was like, well, I could fucking do that. Then I tried to draw out of my imagination or like, you know, out of my memory. And I realized I can't fucking draw. That is a, it's a completely separate skill from being able to do a life drawing and draw something that you're looking at. Totally. I mean, I could sketch something and make it look exactly like what it's supposed to look like if I'm looking at it, like a life drawing or a pose or something like that. When I'm trying to draw figures out of my head now for the first time, things are completely out of proportion. There's no weight to my people. Yeah. You know, there's one arm that's longer than the other. And a lot of stuff I do today still looks that way. But when I first started I wasn't out, it say was it. bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you noticed. <laughs> um, so I kind of had to retrain myself or train myself how to draw for the first time. You know, because well, it's a, it, I mean, like you already knew how to draw. It's just a, it's a completely different skill. I've always yeah. been in awe of people who like comic book kind of artists where they can just sit down and be like, okay, I'm going to draw a Spider-Man falling off of the side of the building and blah, blah, blah. And just out of their brain, make this thing right. that maybe I could imagine, but I could never sit down and draw it the way that you do it. Yeah. What makes that skill set different than kind of the photo reel kind of drawing that you'd been doing up until then? That didn't really transfer into doing boards at all. Is that what you're asking? No, I, I'm actually talking more about just kind of maybe this is like its own podcast and too deep of a rabbit hole, but I think it's actually a really interesting thing to think about. This goes back to you know, when people ask if there's a good storyboarding software. What I'm saying, learn to draw. I'm not saying learn to draw. I'm saying learn to do this. So you already knew how to draw. You already knew how to like have a, a vase of flowers in front of you and draw it and, and make something that looked like, you know. I knew how to copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now you're, you know, after you see this thing from Gladiator and you're thinking about doing this, what's the difference in the skill between drawing something that you're literally looking at right then and there versus kind of coming up with a scenario out of your brain and drawing that? It's two two totally different things. I mean, there's, as far as storyboarding goes, there's so many different components that go into making a sequence. I mean, you have to... The drawing is is almost like the least important thing. I mean, if you have like a basic understanding of how to put, you know, pencil mm-hmm. to paper or make a convincing line or something like that to, to sell something, that's that's about all you need. Yeah. Understanding uh, composition and, and being aware where a camera could be put or how it's going to move. Yeah. The acting of the character. The blocking of the characters. The blocking, uh, the composition, how you want, you know, the frame to look lighting you know when you want to shade some stuff in the foreground or background or draw attention to somebody using light yeah there's so many there's like a description that i heard of it from a producer we both know is they were looking for an artist from the neck up not the wrist down like in other words they're not hiring you and i think this is the central misconception to me of of what we think a storyboard artist does versus what they actually do like we think that you sit in a room with Cecil B. DeMille and he dictates to you, okay, so a close up of this guy and then a, then a dolly shot here and, a, and this and that. When in reality, what happens is you're given script pages or maybe even an outline or maybe not even an outline, but just like three bullet points that have to happen in a sequence. And then you design a sequence basically as a pitch, correct? Yeah. You're not sitting down. Every director you sit down with is an Alfred Hitchcock. He doesn't have everything already in his head and this is exactly how I want it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're more like, this is the feeling I want to get across in this scene. These are the types of beats that we are story points that we want to hit in this scene. This might be the location of the scene, but it could change to this. It could change to that. And we don't know exactly how we want it to go. 
but we know we want it to end in this big spectacular well, fashion. And like, so, for instance, and I think you can talk about this now if you can't just tell me, but like when you were doing uh, Captain America Civil War, you did that big opening sequence and that they just kept changing the entire city that that happened in, right? They created sort of like a framework, if you will. And the directors, obviously, you know, they would sit there and kind of guide the whole thing. You know, when they yeah. felt like things were going the way they wanted it, it was like, okay, so this is the direction we want to go in. But filling in all that stuff, you know, the writers may just say, well, we're going to set this scene up here and then chaos ensues. Mm-hmm. And then they'll table that shit. And then they'll go on to something else that needs more, you know, attention. Yeah, yeah. The studio is asking for Fam- something. Famously, like in Gone with the Wind in the original scenario, there's like a single line that says Atlanta burns. Right. And then they're like, hey, Tony. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like any Fast and Furious movie. It's like, and the most fucking epic car chase you've ever seen. And hmm. that's what the script says. Yeah. And then they're like, it's like hey, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> but there's a lot that goes. It's, it's epic enough, but is it fucking epic enough? Yeah, yeah. They're looking for somebody that can plop down like a pass on the whole thing that they can sit there and kind of digest and look at and pick apart and kind of rework any way they they want it. But the scene needs to be set for them. And I know this is like very normal in the animation world where, where you'll have the heads of story and the head of story is separate from the from the writer. The head of story, it's like, hey, we're, you know, doing a big island chase in The Incredibles. I, I'm bringing this up because I actually saw some of the animatics that they built for The Incredibles for Pixar at, a, at, a, at, a, at a seminar once. What would you say? I said, were they incredible? They were. They, I don't have a word for it. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, it's, what they would do, and I, and I think it's maybe similar, maybe different. You tell me. Uh, they would do kind of a thumbnail pass where they kind of build it out very roughly and they make an animatic. So they'll bring it into After Effects. They'll bring it into some kind of editing software Mm -hmm. and they'll sort of show it to you in motion and maybe they'll put some music under it, but it's super sketchy and loose and crude and gestural and it's not, it's not tight. And then the, and then the director and animation, every animation director is probably an artist of your caliber and they'll come in and tell them what to change and what to change. And then the heads of story go back and do it again and again and again. Yeah. And like on, and they were saying like, I think at this, cause I went to a seminar where they had some of these guys from Pixar and it was like, they would go up to like 19 passes sometimes mm-hmm. before they would nail down what the sequence was actually going to be. So what, what's the process? So you go in, if you can use civil war as an well, example, I, civil war as an example, I would go in and we would all sit down and we'd meet and we throw ideas around based off of, Mm -hmm. you know, where they wanted to go in terms of the story. And um, it's kind of a hard thing because you're looking at two directors, two writers, and a Mm -hmm. producer, and all of them are having different reactions to what you're saying, what somebody else is saying in the room. So being a good note taker, which I'm not really, is (laughs) it comes in pretty handy because, you know, you're looking to see what the reactions are because – uh, Joe Russo might have a positive reaction that's something somebody brings up and Anthony might be like, well, whatever, that doesn't really, I think that's stupid or whatever. You know, he wouldn't say that. But. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to make all these mental notes as to, okay, well, it seemed like they liked this or this went over well in the room or this idea that I had they liked or this idea I had they didn't like. So I would basically take those notes, bring them back home, and then based on everything they said, I would get like general overview notes and make sure that those were like in my head all the time. They want this scene to feel this way. They want the action to feel this way or, you know, those would be the kind of the guiding. And are they giving you like points of reference? Like, Hey, we like this car chase in bullet. We like the, yeah, they'll be like, Hey, when this particular scene, like when, um, Falcon lands on, we're in Lagos in the beginning of Civil War. Falcon lands on top of these kind of rickety tin huts. He's on the roof and it's above this little market area. You know, the way we wanted to kind of block that whole shot, he's looking for these guys that have kind of disappeared into the crowd. They'd be like, hey, you remember in Godfather 2 when uh, Corleone's on top of the um, the building walking down, he's following the parade? We like stuff like that or, you know, like the French Connection or this or that. And I would use stuff like that for reference and mm-hmm. not so much copy it, but just try and get that kind of vibe, you know, for, yeah, for yeah. that particular shot. After getting all those notes down and bringing that stuff home and keeping the, the, the overriding theme or whatever they want, keeping that cognizant, mm-hmm. you know, with everything that I do, I would go and start breaking things down into keyframes, like moments that I know that I wanted to represent in the story. Mm-hmm. So if I would get a certain vision in my head, I would sketch it down and I'd say, okay, I love the way that this looks. I want to keep this in here. 
And I'll go through the whole sequence and I'll start it with just some basic keyframe thumbnails. And then, you know, I'll rearrange those thumbnails around until I feel like the sequence is working, you know, until it's yeah. cutting right and it's paced right. And then from that point, I would bring that into them and show them this is how I see the scene playing out. And then we would go through it and then they would give me notes. In a sequence like that, you know, that's in the final film. I don't know. That, that sequence is probably like five, seven minutes long, I'm assuming. Yeah. How many keyframe panels would you bring in? How much would you have drawn for them? Well, keyframes, um, I don't know, maybe about 300 keyframes. But then you'd have maybe about 900 between frames which are in between the keyframes help sell the animation those are just like a little bit more loose yeah well it's more like the one two three punch thing you know the setup the action and the payoff exactly so you want to have all those kind of in between frames set up for any main action so when you get the whole thing together you could i think lagos ended up the the final pass on lagos ended up being around 1300 frames and you drew each one of those each one yeah Good God. How, but that, that was version four, too. So <laughs> Lagos, before Lagos was Lagos, Lagos was Nigeria. And before Lagos was Nigeria, Lagos was Mexico City. Yeah. So there's a whole ton of stuff. I mean, there must have been a close to about 3,000 frames I drew just for that sequence alone. And how long do you, how long did, would you say you worked on that sequence? Well, I worked on Civil War altogether for a year. I'd say maybe about eight months out of that year was probably that sequence. Wow. And then the other four months I worked on the motorcycle chase in Berlin, which is way different than working with first unit on the Lago stuff because the Berlin chase was all second unit and working with my good friend Spiro, all that stuff was shot practically. So it's a whole different process working with the second unit than there is the first because of the way Spiro likes to shoot. So we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. I want to back up a little bit and continue talking about what are the key things that you learned when you moved from doing kind of straightforward drawing, like figure drawing or whatever, to storyboard style, comic booky style illustration where you're coming up with stuff out of your head. Well, because speed is such a factor in these jobs, it became apparent pretty quickly to me that I had to memorize certain poses. Mm -hmm. So I picked out certain poses that I thought that I could utilize on every job that I did. Is that why every superhero lands the same way? Exactly. You got your three point landing there, <laughs> which is something the Russo brothers told us in our, one of our first meetings, no fucking three point landings. Really? None. And then the first trailer, I see a cap three point landing by Falcon. I was like, what the son of a, <laughs> but no, I knew if I had memorized like a full shot of a guy straight on, mm -hmm. if I could draw a full shot of a guy, I know I can draw a medium shot. Mm -hmm. I would work on that and I would work on like a close up of a face, yeah. three quarter of a face and maybe a profiler face and over the shoulder. Um, and I would just stick to those basic poses that I saw repeating on. Like if I would watch a television commercial, I would pay attention to where they're cutting. Exactly. Because the difference between a medium shot of someone in a dirty close up over somebody's shoulder is the same exact shot, except you've got an out of focus blob of a shoulder of a person. Exactly. So I would learn to memorize certain shots or certain body poses and get those down. And how are you doing that? Are you just, are you using figure drawings or what, how do you go about I that? I would, I purchased every drawing book on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of industry kind of standard books for storyboard artists. They'll tell you uh, drawing comics, the Marvel way mm -hmm. is like a, a John Buscema uh, course on how to draw people. It's, you know, one of the, most amazing figure drawing books that there is. I have flipped through that book many times and thought about buying it and then not bought it. Oh, it's great. Well, you can get a free PDF download online now. If oh, you well, go and look for fuck it. Fuck you, 18 year old me. I'm going <laughs> to exactly. go get that for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would look through that stuff and just start to memorize stuff because it's not something I had ever done before. I had always, like I said, copied stuff. So I wouldn't be able to draw a face just thinking out of it, out of my head, thinking, yeah. of it, let alone making it convincing looking. When I got into it, I was kind of like really far behind everybody else. At least I, I felt that I was. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the artists that I was going out and meeting on the jobs were really, really talented guys. I'll say this for the benefit of the listeners because I've known you for a long time. Uh, you're uh, extraordinarily talented and extraordinarily humble and, <laughs> and have a much lower opinion of yourself than any than anyone who knows you has. Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. But I had a, a guy who's just starting out come over. Um, I have people writing me all the time uh -huh. that ask me for help, and I feel you know I feel obligated to help them because I was helped. 
Yeah. So I invited this one guy over and I brought him into my studio and he was kind of like, man, I just want to get up to your skill level. And if I could just get there, I'd be happy. And I was like, I remember when I would say that all the time. Yeah. It's like, I just want to get to a particular level where I know that I may not be the greatest, but I'm not going to be the shittiest. And I, <laughs> I know I'm on a level where I can actually go out and work. Isn't, and isn't that money. like the rallying cry of every artist once they've been doing whatever it is they do for, you know, more than six months? Like, yeah, I, I just want to not be horrible at this. Yeah. I think most of the guys I work with are probably like, I suck if I could just get here. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, uh, he was pretty down on about how he was drawing and I was like, you know, I want to show you something. So I had uh, one of my external hard drives handy and I plugged it into the computer and I dug into my storyboarding files from like 2003. It was like mm-hmm. my first year working and I pulled that stuff out and when I looked at it, he like almost fell over laughing. He's like, fuck, that was you <laughs> like 12 years ago. I was like, yeah. Well, wow. he's like, my God, you're so awesome now. And I'm like, well, whatever. I don't know how awesome I am, but I've made some progress since then. <laughs> so I was like, just keep that in mind. It's, you know, you just keep practicing, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to get better. And, you know, I looked at his stuff starting. I was way better than the stuff that I did when I was first starting. I can't yeah. believe I was even asked to come back on a job with the shit that I turned in. Oh, come on. Yeah. So are there any other books besides uh, drawing comics, the Marvel way that you would recommend uh, for people who are starting out? Uh, drawing the head and figure by Jack Ham is a book that I would refer to on a daily basis and still do. Really? Yeah, I mean, when you open up this, it's a little paperback book. It's maybe about 50, 60 pages, but there are like thousands of like little illustrations in there on how to draw everything from head to toe. Really? Yeah, even getting into like clothing folds and hair curls and all this stuff. I'll refer back to it, you know, or I'll have like a Pinterest page with a lot of his stuff on it. And if I, you know, because like I really suck at clothing folds, I think. So I'll refer back Mm -hmm. to that for something like that, you know, if I have if I have the time to. So I'll keep those books handy at all, all, all the time or any like my favorite comic book artists I'll keep handy. Yeah. But like that kind of a book, does it, I, I think I've seen that book, but does it kind of take, does it kind of give you the basics of sort of what you need to be thinking about in terms of proportionality, or anatomy, yeah. anatomy and physiology, that kind of thing? It brings out certain like landmarks, if you will, like on um, the body. Like if uh, this particular element of the body is never going to change, mm-hmm. you know, no matter how you turn this or that, you know, he's good at explaining those types of like landmarks and things that are not going to move that you can build your drawing off of. Interesting. Yeah. You know, like the, the, the hips are fused together. So you're never going to have any of this shit going on with your hips like you do with your shoulders because drawing shoulders is tricky. Starting everything off where the hips are, you know, those things are at a fixed point. You know, they're never going to be collapsing in on each other. So you can start there and kind of build out. Unless you're drawing a monster that has shoulders for hips. True, true. Mm. That is true. (laughs) I think I've got a new horror franchise. (laughs) So, uh... hipster. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) So... (laughs) You said it was around 2003 that you started actually uh, doing storyboards. Getting paid for it, yes. Yeah. So when did you when did you come to California? I had come to California in 1986 with my family, mm-hmm. um, but I ended up leaving and going to New York to to um, I started my business out here, but I left and went to New York because it was better area for mm-hmm. us to make money. I ended up coming back and really getting into school out here. In California. In California, yeah. When you were in New York, were you going to school in New York? Yeah, I started, I took some some night classes at community college, mm-hmm. like I was saying, uh, but I just got those credits transferred out to Cypress College, another community college. Hmm. And uh, I just started really taking all my classes there. And, and did you come back here because you wanted specifically to start focusing on the film business? I wanted to get into the film business, yeah. Okay. When I was at uh, oh, Well done. <laughs> yeah. Plan worked. Yeah, so they had this thing going at the time at Cypress, or I should say Cal State Fullerton, that if you had like a 4.0 grade point average in your major, mm-hmm. they would let you start taking your, your classes in your four year on at the um, artist campus in Santa Ana. So I qualified for that. So I was getting into the four year BA stuff. Yeah. But I was still going to community college to finish up my like, you know, like my humanities class and yeah. history and all that crap. Freshman comp. Yeah. So that was about as far as I got in school. After that, it was, I kind of had a bumpy ride in life and had to kind of get my shit straightened out. So I found myself working at a uh, screen door store making like six seventy five an hour and mm. 
but it was the first time I had access to the internet. So I was looking up storyboards and this and that, and oh. I found out a ton of information online. And I remember one guy came in and ordered like a window screen and I'm making it for him. And he turned out to be an art director. And he was telling me about uh, these particular storyboarding agencies that exist. And he's like, you should try and get represented by one of these agencies. So that's what I set out to do. I got in contact with one of the agencies um, and they turned me down when I submitted a portfolio to them. And then they turned me down again and again and again. And it mm-hmm. took me like four years to get repped by them. All the other agencies also. I you ever, you ever go back to them and, and ask them how Crow tastes right about now? Well, that's a funny story. Um, they actually were understaffed or undermanned, I should say, and at, at one time. And they called me and they were like, listen, we really need somebody to go down to meet this director and get some notes and work on this job. Can you help us out? I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I closed up the screen door store and I ran down there (laughs) and put a note on the door and it said back soon. Oh no. So, uh, while I was down there, I'm, you know, this is my very first job. I'm scared shitless. I'm taking notes from the director. Uh, these agents called me again. They said, Hey, on your lunch break, do you mind driving a couple blocks over? Cause I'm in Santa Monica now, um, to this other place, this other production company and get some notes from this other director for a commercial and have that done by tomorrow. So I was like, yeah, whatever you want me to do. So on my lunch break, I jumped in. I went and met with this director, got notes from him, came back. I finished up this job, drove back to the valley, went to the screen store. There's like a hundred screen doors piled up at the back door waiting to be like rescreened. Oh no. People leaving their card. Somebody taped a sign to the wall or a note to the wall. Somebody wrote under the back soon sign says, what does soon mean? (sighs) So then the owner was calling me and I finally had to fess up to him and I was like, listen, I came out to Hollywood to make it in the movie business. And, you know, when he first hired me, he was like, he was like, oh, okay. Well, it looks like you'll be here for a while. Oh, God. But, you know, I told him. I was honest with him. So when the time came for me to leave, I was like, listen, this is what I came to do. This is what I want to do. And, you know, I've never asked for a raise. I've never asked for a day off. Nothing for four years. And I was like, all I want in return is when I go out there and I fall on my face, (laughs) I want a job to come back to. And he's like, all right, no problem. So, you know, I went down there and I did those two jobs and then they called me back and called me back again and called me back again. And uh, they didn't think that I was good enough to be a part of their their permanent stable of artists. So uh-huh. they never really signed a contract with me. They didn't think that I was good enough at that point. Yeah. So one year turned into another year and turned into another year. And next thing I know, you know, I'm working in the film business, you know, without them. Yeah, I got a film job on on my own, and but they never signed a contract with me, so they had no exclusivity with me. So I was like, "Well, you guys never thought that I was good enough to to sign me, so I'm gonna go take this film, (laughs) and I'll be back." And you know, they weren't very happy about it, but Uh, you know, I'm gonna go do the boards that open up uh, next year's Best Picture winner. Yeah, (laughs) Um, (laughs) we'll get to that. Yeah, well the. You know, it was, it was just like that same scenario again. It's like, well, it's time to make another leap here. You yeah. Know? So it's like I, I, I don't like burning bridges. You know, I like to make calculated decisions that, you know, if I have to, to go long for, you know, like a bomb, I will. But I don't particularly like doing that. Yeah. So I, I have a pretty good relationship with them now. I think I do. So it's the same agency you're still with. Yeah, I'm not really with them per se. I mean, if uh, the film work dries up and I need to go back to the commercial world to make some money, you know, I'll call them up and say, hey, I'm available again. Is that, is that the hierarchy in the storyboard world? Is it like you do commercial, like people do commercials until they get a big feature? Or are there, you know, like there are directors who want to make features but who are good at making commercials and they get work doing that, but they're always trying to make features. And then there are guys who and girls who just want to be commercial directors. That's all they want to do. There, you're right. It runs the gamut. I mean, most of the people that I have seen, I think like your standard issue commercial director is trying to make it in film. Mm -hmm. Um, that think that's more often the case than not. I have met guys and girls who that, that is the only thing they want. They're, they're directors who it's like, they're a hundred percent happy just making commercials because commercials are, I mean, I've done some commercials and so I, I can say it's fast turnaround the money is usually better. Good money. They're hiring a director for a specific style that they do, but yeah. really the agency is dictating what gets done. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you're not really creatively having, it's not that you're not sticking your neck out, but it's not like you're making, uh, you're, you're not like tearing out a little piece of your heart and sticking it on the screen at Sundance. You're, you're selling some soap. Yeah, you are. But at the same time, the agency's selling the soap. Yeah. They hired the director to add life to that otherwise <laughs> disgustingly devoid of humanity fucking shit idea that they're trying to sell to you. <laughs> so the director will put like, like I know you know that I work with Dave Myers a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So Dave is a super Dave, talented Dave director. Dave Myers, who's, you know, for those of you who don't know who he is, look him up, but you know, well-known commercial director, music video director, and has directed several features. Right. And Dave would always like to, whenever he would get on the phone with the agency people, he would more often than not completely rip their idea apart. Mm -hmm. He'd be like, well, look, this is great. And I understand the point that you're trying to get across here. But his all his go to line was always I need to inject some human humanism in this thing. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's not enough of the human element going on. But here. that's why they're hiring him. Right. So he would rework their idea from top to bottom. Like almost every single job I've done with him, he the idea that they came to him with was completely reworked by the time he got done with it. So, I mean, a lot of times the agencies hire the storyboard people, but uh, in this case, would they would they have would would you go on with Dave Myers and work with him to rework their concept, or would the agency hire you to be the storyboard artist from the beginning? There's usually two different artists that work on a commercial campaign. If you and will. we're talking about like a big national, like Super Bowl kind of commercial. We'll use Toyota as an example. You, we'll go to Saatchi. Because Saatchi has the Toyota account. Mm -hmm. Saatchi will hire. And got Saatchi's, hired, Saatchi's a huge ad agency. Huge ad, ad one, agency. One of the biggest. So I would get hired to go to Saatchi and work on a couple car keyframes. Um, when they get the artwork that they want, they take it back and they pitch it to the client. You mm -hmm. know, and the client will sign off on one of so many ideas. They'll take the winning idea. They'll take that to the production company. And the production company with the director, you know, the director will hire his storyboard artist. Mm -hmm. And that artist will come in and help him create an actual story out of their idea. So you'll have the agency storyboard artist who's in the more creative end of the whole commercial thing because yeah. he actually gets to contribute ideas to the creative idea process from the very beginning. Just like you would on a feature. Just like I would on a feature. But for the commercial storyboard artist, he's going to be doing the actual boards, but he has very, very, very little creative input on what's going on because of the idea is already pretty much decided. Um, the director then will, you know, he'll have his treatment written up based on their idea and he'll have a pretty good idea about what he wants because a 30 second spot is usually broken down into maybe like 20 to 30 panels, maybe yeah. 40. Since the, the shot selection is so small, they'll have a pretty tight idea of what they want. And that would be more, I mean, I guess like they're going to want your input, but that, that might be more of a case of, you know, you're sitting in a room with Dave Myers and him saying, okay, I'm going to want a wide shot of this. I'm going to want a dolly shot of that. It's more, that's how it is more or less with commercials. They'll dictate pretty much, yeah. you know, what they want to see to you. Now, I worked with Dave Myers for about 10 years. Um, and it got to the point where he was just like, listen, I don't know exactly what I want to do with this job. So why don't you give me a first pass of this? And he already knew that, you know, I had started, I would gotten into films at that point And he yeah. knew that I was kind of going down that road anyway. So I would always kind of make the effort to say, Hey, would you like me to give you a first pass on this? So you don't have to bother with it right now. You can go, you know, think about this other thing. And he'll be like, yeah, yeah, great. So and at this point too, he knows that you get his sensibility and you know, right. you know, the kind of work he does. Yeah. But not many commercial directors are like that. And not many artists have that kind of relationship with a commercial director because the, the, the turnaround times are so quick and certain yeah. artists aren't available for that particular director all the time you don't really establish that kind of relationship with a commercial director. I mean, you can, like I did with Dave, but the point is more often than not, it's the storyboard artist will go in for a commercial gig and it, the shots will pretty much be listed out for him. I mean, I've gone to jobs where a whole shot list was just handed to me and I'll just go thumbnail those shots out, show them to the director and you know, we're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's very well, little creative input by the storyboard can, artist. Can I ask a really ignorant, stupid ass question? Sure. If they're that specific about it and they're handing it to you and it's really not that creative of a thing for you to do, why do they need you at all on a job like that? Well, because the turnaround time is so fast. They still need to, even though the director knows what he wants, it's still a written shot list. Yeah. And nobody is visual. Nobody. 
It's like oh, so it's it's a sales tool for the client. Yeah, it's a sales tool for the client, but it's also a blueprint for the rest of the crew. You Got know? it. It's like if you're talking about if you're getting into the minutia of a certain shot, the director doesn't have to explain to you what the shot is. It's hold it up. This is what yeah. we want. You see this back here. We're not doing this, so it can serve as do not do this, or you see this back here. We want this in here. Yeah. So there's all little kinds of bits that that go into each frame or each composition that you can't get through in any really clear way unless you're showing somebody a picture of it. Well, yeah, and I guess when I think about it too, it's like when you're on a commercial set with a client who isn't production savvy. No. Like you can't, exp- you know, someone who works for Nike or something like that, like their job isn't necessarily to be a creative visionary because if they really were that visionary, then again, they wouldn't need you. Right. I mean, sometimes the storyboards serve as a tool to, as, as like subterfuge, you know, to keep the agency people <laughs> out of the mix. It's like, just show them this and I'm going to do yeah. this over here. It all depends on how the director's relationship is with the client and with the, the agency and how comfortable they are. Yeah, yeah. Each director has their own little scheme down. You know, I remember <laughs> one director was like, don't, he's like, draw everything really, really, really general. He's like, just borderline stick figures. I just want like, a circle for a head, maybe some eyes. Don't get into any detail about clothing or background or this or that. I remember that same director. I'd put like, like an object on a table. It was like mm. a two shot of people eating at this table, and I think it was for like syrup, pancake syrup or something. Mm-hmm. And I put something that looked like a larger vase in the background. I didn't even think it was anything. I'm just trying to fill the space up to make the composition look better. You know? Yeah, yeah. And the, the agent or the client freaked out because this large, this thing that was larger than the Aunt Jemima bottle was oh, on no. the table behind. They're like, oh my God, what is that? Where's that coming from? We don't have that. Where, where do we find something like that? Should that even be on the table? And, uh-huh. and the director looks at me and he's shaking his head. He's like, this is why I want you to keep it simple with these people because they don't fucking get it. Uh-huh. Any little thing they see they're, that they don't know what it is, they're freaking out about it. Oh my God. So, you know, that was his particular needs. You know, another director might be like, I need these very detailed, you know, because yeah. I'm trying to sell this idea and I want to make it look cool. You know? Yeah. So it's, it, it, it all well, depends it, on it goes without saying in. that like the more detailed you make it once, the, once the client signs off on something that's more detailed then you are required to deliver that level of detail later. Right. Talk to me a little bit about, about when you started transitioning into film. Is it something that you consciously chose to do or is it something that was just a natural progression? I know it was something you wanted, right? It was something that I wanted to do, but the doors were kind of closed on doing features because of the whole union thing. So I wasn't able to go straight into doing features. What is the union for storyboard artists? The 800. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're originally the 790 because we were put in the illustrators union. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that didn't really work because... We're, we're still in the wrong union, in the art director's mm-hmm. union, because we don't really, nobody really knows where to put us, because what we do is art. Yeah. So they put us in the art department, even though we don't work in the art department. We're not hired by the production designer or the art director. Yeah. There was talk about either putting us into the DGA or the Writers Guild, which we, either one of those two would have made more sense. Both of those make a lot of sense, but you don't want to be in a guild, man. Yeah. Well, I'm in it, the art it's, director's guild. It's Oh, I guess the... I mean, it's like I'm in the director's guild and I'm not disgruntled about being in the director's guild. But like if I'm to do any project ever, it has to be DGA signatory. Whereas like if you're an IATSE, like let's say you're an IATSE cinematographer, you can go shoot. You can you can work on something that's not union. Right. Uh, you just don't get union protection. But in the DGA, if like you and I want to go make a short film next weekend, it's got to be a DGA signatory. Wow. Which doesn't necessarily cost money. If it's, if it's literally you and me fucking around, then it right. doesn't, you know? And uh, I mean, the thing is like, I, I don't even know how you regulate that. Cause like you can draw, like I can't go direct a movie on my own. I mean, I guess I could, but I still need actors and stuff. Right. But like you could, you know, have a spiral bound notebook and a ballpoint pen and draw whatever storyboards you wanted. They can't stop you. No, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know what the, uh, the benefits are being in the art department. I mean, in the art directors guild versus being in a, in another guild, I just know that, um, it would make sense to put you in the director's guild or the writer's guild though, because, it, because your job sort of spans both of those things. Yeah. I mean, it's we're we're the first visual representation of the script and yeah. that means cinematography. It means writing. It means directing. Um, we're one of the only people on the entire crew other than the director that can make creative decisions with impunity. Yeah. Nobody else can really. 
I mean, we're encouraged to. I mean, we have to because nobody else is making these decisions. You know, they're kind of sitting there waiting. Where are these directing jobs where there's no impunity? Anyway. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, they're, it's, you are writing at its most primitive basic form. You're yeah. writing with pictures. Well, I don't like, see how it gets any more clear than that. Notoriously, like uh, Mad Max Fury, Fury Road, they didn't even have a script. It was basically just one giant storyboard. Yeah, Mark Sexton, who I think I might be working with very soon. I have my fingers crossed. Um, he basically, there was something like 1,700 storyboard panels. Yeah. And the just started at the top corner and started going through them and xing them all off. There, there was basically no script. That's um, nuts. I mean, it's nuts, actually. That's really smart. <laughs> I don't know why that these things aren't started in advance like this and just let the creative process happen and get the entire movie down in a visual form like that and just... Well, it's be- I think it's because, you know, like uh, I heard an interview once with Sam Raimi talking Excuse about... my ignorance. Well, no, he was talking about Spider-Man 3. And, you know, why he didn't do Spider-Man 4, basically. And he said that making Spider-Man 3, it was like they chose a release date before they started writing the script. And he said it was like being thrown out of an airplane with a bunch of silk and a needle and thread and having to make a parachute while you're falling. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing good comes of that. It's like, you know, you want a quality product. It's you have to spend time thinking about it and tweaking it and, and you know, test driving what you're coming up with. Which is entirely what your yeah. job exists in great part for that. So that the filmmaker is lucky enough to hire you. Right. Uh, that's that's why their storyboard artists have to be fast and you know and, and it's a low cost thing. It's because we're churning out the stuff relatively quickly so you can go through it and see what works and yeah. what doesn't work. And I mean correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, you know, once upon a time putting together putting together an animatic would have been very costly. But now you can run, you know, Adobe Premiere or Avid or whatever, what have you on any laptop and bring in a bunch of JPEGs and string them together. And you can do zooming in and doing focus pulls and moving shit around. Mm -hmm. Or you can just do kind of a straight animatic where you're just putting them together and and choosing how, which is pretty much how you do it in animation, choosing how long you want each shot to be. Yeah, depending on what, uh, who you're working for and what the production is. I mean, when you're doing a film for Marvel, you're turning in a sequence that's, you know, rendered out in premiere or whatever, you know, I've seen some intricate, like, uh, I think it was after Iron Man three, uh, one of the animatics for one of the big, like the sequence where his house blows up or something. Federico that, D'Alessandro. Is that the artist? Yes. Yeah. And like that sequence I'm looking at, I'm like, well, that's exactly what I saw when I saw that movie. Like yeah. to, to a T they shot that, that sequence. Federico is the man. They pretty much give him, uh, just, the leeway that he that he wants it's just like this is what we are envisioning come up with it you know and mm-hmm. and they have taken whole sections of his sequences and just shot them exactly the way that he previs them out I, I again like i mean if we go back to you know long before you and i were able to do any of this stuff you know raiders of the lost ark or something mm-hmm. you know in raiders of the lost ark they obviously boarded the shit out of everything. I don't mm. think that, that they had the budgets back then to make an animatic, much less something like Previs, which didn't even exist at the time. I think the first form of animatic, like a live action animatic, was um, what George Lucas was doing for the, um, what do you call it, the cannon fight in the Millennium Falcon mm-hmm. when Luke and Han f- escape the Death Star and they're each on one of the, the cannons. Yeah. Well, when you see those like TIE fighters panning over, they he would cut together this World War II footage of like, you know, like a belly gunner in a B-17 and you yeah. see like these measure smiths flying by. He would cut all that stuff together and make like these very primitive, kind of like the first working animatics. You know, it was all the stitched together shit, but it made sense. Yeah, yeah. When he was creating, I mean, the Avid ultimately I think comes out of the edit droid, which was like a laser disc based editing system that he had created for one of those movies a million zillion years ago. Right. So he was doing kind of non, he was, I mean, George Lucas, you know, I, I always rag on the prequels, but, (laughs) but I mean like so much of movie technology that we just take for granted wouldn't even have existed if had it not been for, for his pushing stuff forward. And when, when we're editing animatics uh, today, it's a very purely creative process. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Editing together boards is like my favorite thing to do. It's like to, to drop the stuff into a software program where you can actually see your shots cutting together and it's making sense and it's reading and you're seeing the sequence come to life. It's like one of the most ex- amazing experiences, at least that I have. I, have. I love working in Premiere and, and, and getting that, seeing the actual sequence build and come to life. So... 
Well, do you think that having all this technology at our fingertips as we do now, do you think that it is sort of making sequences more complex because it's easier to envision them? Yeah, probably. I mean, because you can, I mean, you can really push for that complexity at the, at the basic level now at the drawing level, because there's so many artists that are using, like they're integrating like Maya or um, cinema 4d or SketchUp into their work now where you're seeing actual 3d types of moves in the actual animatic itself. So yeah, when they see something like that, that's already kind of worked out into in a sense. By the time the VFX people get a hold of it, it's like it's not that complicated anymore. It's like okay, well, we know exactly how we want this thing to go because we want it to look exactly like the way it does in the animatic. And because you stress tested it, and you know, like yeah. obviously, there's a big difference between Google Sketch. What's well, not Google anymore? But SketchUp and 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 <laughs> Industrial Light and Magic or Weta effects, the people who are going to execute it. But the basic right. concepts of a 3D object and a camera are are there. So yeah, you're sort I mean, of if you're working in After Effects, you can get the camera down, um, or in Cinema 4D, or in Maya. You know, you can pick the lenses. You know, you have the focal distance. How you know it's all in virtual space or whatever. But whatever you can think up and get down in one of those programs, they can actually get with a real lens and a real camera. Interesting. So, and how many of these programs are you now using as, as a basic thing in your process? Uh, well, I'm learning. I just bought, um, I just got the Creative Cloud update for After Effects. I actually got it this morning and uh-huh. it's got Cinema 4D Lite on it. So I'm trying to, to learn the Cinema 4D part of it because I like to integrate some, I like to be able to do smooth camera moves like inside a building or around a building and be able to drop um, my drawings into it. Mm-hmm. The old way of me doing it was building a model in After Effects, doing the camera move through the model, and then maybe trying to match. Like if I need to drop a person running, like if we're tracking with a person running through yeah. this maze, let's say, I would kind of have to pose that thing out in Poser and then export the, the the running pose or whatever it would be into like a bunch of TIFF files. And then bring the TIFF files into After Effects. After Effects will read it and understand what you're trying to do with it. And it brings it in. And then you just match, sync the two up in After Effects. So it looks like the person is now running. It's Mm. composited over the camera move that you did. You don't have to do all that stuff now. The way it was explained to me um, in Cinema 4D, there's like now like a hyperlink between Cinema 4D and Oh, yeah. You're drawing in Photoshop, right? Drawing in Photoshop. uh, I'd say it's like 80% hand-drawn in Photoshop. Any other elements I'll add in there. Um, if I'm doing Fast and Furious stuff, I'll just use SketchUp models now because mm-hmm. I can get the exact car. If I'm going to set up a little scene. Most of those are free, right? There, Yeah, you can go to the uh, 3D warehouse and get pretty much anything you want. Well, anything they have, you know, mm-hmm. it's totally free. Um, so when I'm doing boards for Fast and Furious, they'll tell me the types of cars that are in the scene. I can go get those cars or, or ones that are pretty close to them. I can get, you know, wide angle lenses on the cars. I can, you know, mount the camera anywhere I want on the car mm-hmm. and get the exact shot that they're looking for. So this kind of brings us to the most current development in your career, which is working on like basically the movies that are bolstering the entire uh, film industry. So you've worked on like what, like four or five Fast and Furious movies? Five, six, seven, and eight. So four of them. Four of those, and you've worked on uh, a metric fuck ton of Marvel films, right? Uh, no. Well, I got called for a bunch of Marvel films, but I've only had the opportunity to work on two of them, and now going oh. into my third. Okay, um, so so you worked on Winter Soldier and I worked on Winter Soldier and Civil War, but I got the call for um, Ant Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, Doctor Strange. So the Fast and Furious, then in addition to that, you worked on Skull Island. Skull Island, Monster Trucks, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. We were talking about this the other day. I asked you how many of the films that you've worked on were number one at the box office, and you said... Every single one. (laughs) And then, of course, uh, Argo, which I not only did you do shooting boards for, but you did the boards that open up the movie. Yes. The opening sequence of the film is basically kind of sort of like an animatic. It's a voiceover, some storyboards that kind of tell the story of the, uh, how the Shaws came to power in Iran, the American presence there and everything leading up to the whole, um, embassy takeover. And it's a really clever idea because it kind of introduces the idea of filmmaking alongside of telling us the history lesson of, of where we're setting the story. Yeah. And it was the storyboards were the storyboards themselves in particular were like a key component in these people, getting out of 
you know, well, when they were in the airport trying to get past those guards, the the producers or the crew members, yeah. the fake TV people were showing them the storyboards. And those are also boards you drew, right? Those are not boards that I drew. That was, um, uh, there's so many artists involved on this. Oh man, it would just be so cool if you had done the, the boards that opened the movie, if you had boarded the movie and that your boards were also props in the movie. Yes. And then I went back in time and redid all of Jack Kirby's boards. <laughs> Yeah, those those panels. Well, what happened in real life, I guess, is they were showing Jack Kirby's panels to the Iranian guards, and they were so. Like, were those wow. the actual Jack Kirby panels? No, it was another artist redid the boards, and I forget his name, Ray something. I forget. There's it's a funny thing. It's really confusing about that that movie is that you had about four different kinds of boards that are linked to that movie. There were the boards that were in the movie, the prop storyboards. Mm. They were the shooting boards for the movie that the great Alex Hilkert did. Mm -hmm. Great storyboard artist. He did the actual functioning shooting boards for the film. Then you have my storyboards that opened the film. And then there's another set of storyboards that another artist named Tim Burgard did that was for, um, it was like a promotional release. It Hmm. was in like a premiere type magazine or a Hollywood reporter. It was a whole article of Argo storyboards, but they had nothing to do with the actual production of it. It's so weird. Yeah, I don't even know what they were used for. It was specifically for like... And it was in uh, something called a magazine. I'm unfamiliar with what y- that is. Yes. Isn't that something you put bullets in? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Things that sit bet- beside your toilet forever. <laughs> um, oh, an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, there were like these four different sets of boards that were used for that film. So at a certain point, you know, you're mostly doing commercials. Yes. Right? And then you kind of, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not understanding it, you, but you kind of hop, skipped and jumped from that to like the, the highest echelon of films. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of luck as you know, <laughs> in the movie business, mm-hmm. you know, if you're working hard and you have your shit together in terms of, I know what I'm doing, I'm drawing as good as I can draw. I'm knowing as many things as I need to know and I'm working hard and I'm ready. So if you're at that point and an opportunity comes along, it may be a little bit of an outlier type of deal. So what was the opportunity? What was the thing that that bridged the two worlds for you? Well, I was working at Universal uh, Studios um, and I was doing some storyboards for Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to be some, they wanted an interactive um, special features display on the DVD. When you would go through, you could like click and customize your own car. Um, The the thing that was never made, but the idea was you could pick a car. I was like, that does sound kind of complicated for DVD technology. Yeah, it's like you could put certain wheels on it and the Mm -hmm. car would drive through a scene and you could select this scene or that scene. That's bananas. Yeah. So that's what they were trying to do. So when we were in there doing that... And Tokyo Drift, when they made Tokyo Drift, correct me if I'm wrong, that was going to go straight to DVD, right? It was straight to DVD, and it tested so well that they decided to release it. And Sung Kang, I think Mm -hmm. he played Han in the movie, he tested better than anybody else in Universal Studios' history. Wow. This is what I've been told more than once his character was like so off the charts that they were like, okay, well the movie's testing. Well, people love this guy. We're going to release it. And then when it came out, it was made a shit ton of money. Cause that was the third fast and furious. The first one had been a moderate hit. The second one had done not quite as well at the time. Home video was kind of a viable market, but that it isn't as much of today. So the, so the third one sort of set the tone for the rest of them. Yeah. What happened was, is two days after that I worked on the um, fast and furious special features thing, I had gotten a job with somebody. Um, somebody referred me to um, uh, this director, and he was looking for somebody to help him come on and board out a web series. So I remember driving over to Silver Lake to meet this guy at um, a place called Astro Burger. So I go in and I sit down, and we start going over the Sea Do stuff. I had what, what is Sea Do? Sea Do is like uh, you know the Wave Runners. Oh, okay. He asked me, is like just kind of like an offhanded question. Like, so what do, what have you been working on? It's Justin Lin. And he's just like, you were talking to Justin. <laughs> <laughs> this feeds into my belief that Astro plays a crucial role in the whole world <laughs> order. Go on. So, well, when I went home, I was like, you know what? I better like fucking perform here. You know, so I knocked out like 118 frames for him that night for Sea Do, uh-huh. and he ended up getting a job, and he shot it, and then he called me later for a Cadillac commercial that he was doing. 
and I did that for him. Um, and then he called me when fast four was starting and I wasn't in the union yet. So I couldn't give him, I couldn't give him a hand on it. Uh, but he kept me in mind, which was super cool. That is cool. Yeah. But you know, in all fairness, I, you know, I worked my ass off for him. I wanted to make him happy. I wanted to, you know, yeah, you, know, yeah. I, you know, I wanted to please him. I wanted to give him what he wanted and, you know, um, so to make a long story short, I ended up getting in the union right after he had called me. So I called him back or sent him an email. I said, Hey, um, well, this wasn't right after he called me. This was almost about a, a year after he called. And I said, Hey, listen, I'm in the union. I know you have tons of talented people available to you at any given time. If you need somebody or if there's anything I can do for you, you know, cleaning up your bathroom, whatever, you know, <laughs> I like to be involved. And he wrote me back like three weeks later. He's like, P- hey. Yes, I love Tokyo Drift. Yes. <laughs> P.S. Tokyo Drift's my favorite movie. He wrote back to me saying, hey, I'm starting to crew up for Fast Five. Are you, you be interested in helping us out? So that was your ticket. That was my ticket. I was like, fuck yeah. So That's great to hear. Yeah. Was, so, yeah, it was, again, it was when opportunity met, you know, hard work. Preparation and yeah. Yeah. So, but that's kind of just where it started because at the same time, Another young man named Spiro Rosados, who is a second unit act- action director, was starting to come up through the ranks. He had done, I think his biggest film up to that point was like Death Race 2000 or something, like the remake of it. Not a small film. Not a small film. Um, and uh, He was a former stuntman, right? He's a former stuntman that turned into a second unit director. And this guy, his crew started back in like the um, PM Entertainment days, you know? Oh, I know I know who they are. Okay, so he, I, he came I, I up with that the, bunch. I missed, I missed PM Entertainment by several years. But. <laughs> okay, well, he came up with that bunch. And they were like the guys that were like driving the fucking A-Team van and, and nice. Knight Rider and the Dukes of Hazard and Riptide Helicopter. And so I, I guess I missed those people by like 20 years, but okay. yeah. <laughs> so, so Justin had really fought to get Spiro onto the film because he liked what he was doing. And Justin really wanted all the films to be shot practically. He wanted all the stunt work to be real. Mm -hmm. We went down to Puerto Rico to scout and that's where he introduced me to Spiro. He says, you're going to be working with this guy. So Spiro and I are out scouting and, you know, I had no idea who Spiro was or what he had done. I was just like scared shitless. I didn't know what this guy (laughs) wanted, what he was expecting from me. And at the same time, Spiro had never really worked with a storyboard artist before in this type of fashion. Really? Yeah, it was his kind of big moment. So in a way, we both kind of landed on the same thing together, you know, at this very same time. You know, he gave me the creative freedom to start coming up with stuff. And um, I was way more timid at that point. After a while, you know, Fast Five was a big hit. And, uh, you know, they greenlit six. And then we kind of reunited for that one. And then that started leading into the next thing. And now, you know, all these movies were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And everything we worked on was like number one, number one, number one, number one. So now Spiro is this huge commodity. For people who don't know, because like I've directed second unit, but the second unit I directed was nothing like what Spiro does. I mean, what Spiro does is... It's not true second unit. Is it not? No. No. Like on a James Bond movie or a movie that's like very... Well, I mean, I, what is second unit? I mean, isn't traditionally it's like pickup shots and... Yeah, when I did second unit, it would... Uh, inserts. Inserts. Well, I had talked to Todd Hallowell, uh, who had done second unit for Ron Howard a bunch and who you and I had worked for. And Todd said that when they were working on... Uh, he Ap- shot the bitch in Quicksilver scene for X-Men. He did. He? That was badass. He told me on Apollo 13, he had t-shirts made up that said if it was easy, first unit would have done it. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah, but I sort of feel like... Spiro takes second unit to like yet another level because he's basically doing all the car chases in the fast and furious movies. Mm -hmm. That's like not this in no way is trying to bring down the level of what the first unit director is doing because they're overseeing what he's doing in addition to overseeing every other thing on this massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. But he's basically the reason that we're there to watch a movie is to see some badass car chases that are like, you know, setting a new standard for what can be done with a car chase and that's all you and Sparrow. Yeah, and he's working with actors too. The whole goal of shooting practically is to shoot as practically as possible, meaning we put the actors in the cars whenever we can. Yeah. So he's dealing with that also. 
it's more, I guess, uh, a better description just to call it the action unit. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, he's not there getting pickups or inserts. He'll lower himself to getting plate shots, I guess, you know, because they have to get that type of stuff since they're out there. But they probably have another unit that's doing pickups and inserts, right? There's a splinter unit that works with him that'll do it, or there might be a VFX camera crew out yeah, there like, getting I mean, plate like, shots. When I did second unit, and I don't think this is horribly dissimilar to most second units, it's like you got a camera guy, you got an AC, you got maybe a gaffer. Mm-hmm. You got a couple of PAs. That's it. Yeah, no, this is a full. If you go to, if you saw the crew in Iceland where we just were, you're talking hundreds of people. Yeah. It, it's a huge operation because it, it is the movie. I mean, the, yeah. the stunts are the main character and the main draw of the film. And that's why they would want him to come back as much as they would want Vin Diesel to come back because it is a major character in the film. It kind of transcends just that film uh, story. You know, people be like, well, I want that in my story. It looks great, it's practical. Yeah. I mean, even you were making the comment about Civil War. Yeah. The one sequence that was completely previs and devoid of any like real practical action was the airport fight. Yeah. But you go into Lagos. Spear was supposed to shoot the Lagos stuff, but he was busy um, with his Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So somebody else had to take over, but that's all practical for the most part. Yeah. The motorcycle chase with Bucky and Panther and Cap. That was all practical. It looked great. Yeah, yeah. It looked amazing. There's just like nothing like real physics, real light hitting real surfaces. I yeah. mean, it's real. It's practical. It's, it is what it is. I mean, if you see the stuff that we're like the stuff that we're doing for Fast 8, the rigging and the, the, the amount of stuff that we build in, in order to make these cars do what they do and react to certain types of stress or situations or explosions or whatever, you can't convincingly fake that stuff. I mean, it just looks so great the way Spiro does the stuff. You know, it's like you're seeing the final product in the dailies or whatever. And not the final product, but you're seeing what he got. And it's just like, shit, it looks phenomenal. So just a couple other questions before we wrap things up here. I always ask cinematographers a question, and I'm trying to come up with the storyboard version of it. So okay. the question I always ask cinematographers, and I feel like storyboards, the answer is going to be obvious. Here, let's, we'll give it a shot. I believe that cinematographers either come at it from a lighting point of view or a camera point of view. So they're either imagining the way they're going to light a shot and then finding the frame within the shot, or they're thinking of a composition and then lighting into that composition. I don't know if there's a version of that for a storyboard because you're thinking in terms of composition all the time. But is there a time where you're thinking in terms of like, here's the vista and let me find the right composition within it? I think I'm always thinking of what the composition is first just to establish that sort of feeling or the mood of whatever the sequence is going to be. So I'll think in terms of this works as a composition. So I'll start here as a starting point and Mm -hmm. then see how I want to move the camera or cut. Would you say that that's probably how all storyboard artists approach it? I don't know. I think it's probably a, a lot of people probably work that way. They'll, they'll start from a key frame and think of a certain shot with a certain type of composition to it. Yeah. Go from there. I would imagine. There was another storyboard artist I'd edited this uh, Santa Claus animated feature years ago, and I never knew any of the storyboard artists. There was one guy who I just referred to disparagingly to the director as Mr. Sketchy because his <laughs> his his work would just be like three squiggles. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, it was like really you had to hire a guy? I can do that. <laughs> but uh, once I started putting his stuff into the animatic, you'd be like, no, no, you, you see, you see, he's got it thought out, and he's just cranking out. I I mean, God only knows how many. Uh, panels Mr. Sketchy was making per day. (laughs) Probably a lot. Um, Yeah. The other question, and I asked this to cinematographers, but I actually think this is a great question to ask you because your relationship to directors is different. If if you had to create the perfect director in a laboratory to work with you exactly to get the best work out of you that you could imagine, and there doesn't have to be an answer to this, by the way, if you can't, you know, like, don't worry about it if there isn't. But like, what is it that you want from a director? Do you want more specificity do you want more freedom what is the perfect relationship between you and a director i guess a director who will say take as much time as you like (laughs) (laughs) i don't know i used to find myself craving structure uh where a director would give me notes and tell me what he was on his mind or what he thought because i was never i'm still not very good at kind of deciphering the esoteric talk that some directors have you know when they talk about feelings and Mm -hmm. not talking about something specifically that they want to see but I'm leaning more towards of that type of person now where they'll describe more of like a feeling to me mm-hmm. and let me try and get that across myself in, in the sequence. I guess to have more leeway, just give me a general type of direction to point me in and just let me go at it is, mm-hmm. is the, 
type of director that I like to work with. And do you think in order to work with a storyboard artist like that, a director would, they would need to be working with someone with like your level of experience. Like the, the gentleman you were talking about earlier, who's just starting out. If I said, I want edge of your seat and that's it. Like it's a big chase scene. Like would that kind of guy even know where to start? I don't think he would even know where to start. A lot of these guys, when I'll call them say, Hey, I have a job opportunity for you. If you, if you want to jump in on this nine times out of 10, they'll turn the job down because they know that, oh, well, shit, I don't, I'm not at that level yet, or I'm not, I don't yeah. feel comfortable, or, and they're probably right. I mean, you can't really take a guy who's been doing commercials forever and drop him into the film world. And, and I mean, he might be able to kind of fake his way through it, kind of like I did, <laughs> <laughs> but he's so trained into being dictated shots to that he's not thinking in sequence. Yeah. You know? He's not thinking of the overriding theme or the big picture of the whole thing, you know. So the the job would be different in that he would kind of to circle around what we've been talking about. Like right. he'd be expected to sort of write the sequence in pictures. Right, exactly. So I don't know where that where he would feel comfortable, you know, going out on a limb or where yeah. he feel like he should dial it back, you know, because he has to have that kind of those narrative rules in his head, which most commercial artists don't have because they're just not aware of them. And maybe it's because there's a scarcity of really good illustrators out there, but it seems like in the storyboard world, there is like a path, like the one you've taken that you can actually climb the ladder and eventually get to, you know, I don't think every artist even with decent aptitude is going to get to where you've gotten, but you could, somebody who has a basic sense of drawing and composition could probably get into some level of commercials and slowly get to bigger commercials and then maybe eventually graduate to features. Yeah. I mean, that's, if you look at, graduating the features as a thing. I mean, yeah. you could have a guy who wants to become an advertising artist. I know a lot of guys that work for my agents that, you know, are making a ton of money Yeah, that are huge. Uh, there's an artist named Lyle Grant, um, mm-hmm. Dan Milligan. These guys are like incredible illustrators. Like Dan Milligan's on par, in my opinion, he's like the digital version of, um, like a Norman Rockwell. Really? Yeah. Dude, he's fantastic. He's incredible. All he does is advertising stuff. But he sits at his home up in Canada, where he's from, and he doesn't come, he doesn't travel, he doesn't do anything. He dictates his terms to these people because he's fucking huge in that industry. Yeah. And all he's got to do is, you know, rattle out six to eight frames in over a two or three day period, but they're just nicer and tighter looking, but they're all in his style. He's got it all down. He knows what he's doing. Some people would prefer that. You know, you're not in a union or anything, or you're not doing, you know, you're not getting medical benefits or any of that, but he's also probably making about, you know, 1200 bucks a day doing what he does yeah so he can afford the insurance you know it's not like a big deal he's also in canada so he has got you know right well point being is that he doesn't need to yeah not being in any unions not affecting him he he can figure out another way to get a nice car and moreover he doesn't he doesn't need to crank out three thousand panels right for a, a small sequence and even for me i was perfectly happy being in commercials you know i was like i said i was working at a screen door store i had my illustration professor tell me i that i had to have a fucking master's degree and teach and make <sighs> like forty thousand dollars a year that was what was awaiting me you know yeah. just working in commercials it's like i was making really good money for the first time in my life i would have been perfectly happy staying in commercials it's just that in the back of my head there was always movies yeah. Yeah, I'm a big movie fan. That's what you wanted to do. Yeah, I like telling stories. Yeah. You know, I've tried to make comic books and stuff, you know, but I never had the time to get anything fucking done. And, but, you know, I still know that I want to tell stories. So however I can get in and and be able to put my creative storytelling to use or get to show that off, you know, films is, is the best outlet for me to do that. I mean, look, I get two days out of the week, I get paid my rate to sit around and dream of stuff. Uh-huh. I'll get up, go take a shower. I'm making money today. <laughs> yeah. And I'm in the same shower thinking, well, you know, this would look cool if I did this, or maybe we do this, or maybe we get this across. Oh, this is a great idea. So, you know, mm-hmm. there's a couple of days there where I'm just, you know, being paid to sit and think and come up with cool shit. And it's like, you know, I'm not complaining about anything. Yeah. Well, I also get to make the first iteration of the film. Yeah. It's like, here it is. You know, it's, 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 this is the first incarnation of what, you know, things could be. I have the opportunity to make that first pass and that's the job. That's what I love. It's like, you give me that first opportunity to lay things out for you. I'm going to try my best to fucking knock your socks off, whether it's right or spectacularly wrong. (laughs) It's going to knock your socks off. And I always go for making it as crazy as I can make it or as big as I can make it because things are only going to get whittled down from that point. 
Yeah. You know, like Fincher told me on the job one time, you know, he's after he left, he pops his head back in the room. And he says, Hey, Tony, um, remember if we're not 10 stories up standing on one foot on the ledge, juggling fucking chainsaws, what are we fucking doing here? I was like, okay. Hmm. I kind of took that bit of advice and I kind of put it in everything now. It's like, well, I might as well just shoot for the moon, you know, without getting ridiculous. But no, that, know, that is great advice. Fucking go for it and let them imagine, cut it down. imagine great wisdom coming from David Fincher. I know. Crazy, mm. right? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky son of a bitch. He was a great guy to work with. So I think that's a really good place to leave it, though. Where can uh, people find you if they're looking for you online to see some of your amazing work? They can go to TonyLiberatory.com. T-O-N-Y-L-I-B-E-R-A-T-O-R-E.com. Is the Facebook group Framed Dump, is that an open group that anyone can join? Uh, I believe it is. If you go on uh, Facebook and go to Framed Dump and ask to become a member, there are dozens of artists there, like Dan Milligan's on there. Um, These guys post their work. I'm a member of that, and like I'm not a storyboard artist at all, and I'm I'm just constantly in awe of the work that people post up there. Yeah, so am I. I mean, I love looking at that stuff when they put it up there. If I'm ever lucky enough to be able to hire another storyboard artist, and you're and you're not available, I'll do it for you. And you're not available. I the first place I'll go look is Frame Dump. I'll be available. You'll be making a fast fast eleven. You'll be you'll be directing and producing it by then. All right, well, uh, Tony Libertori, thank you so much for coming on to the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you. All right, so that was Tony Libertori. Tony, thank you again for coming out, and I will see you as I'm walking my dogs, and maybe we'll go to Sharky's again like we do sometimes. <laughs> and for all of you not in Los Angeles, Sharky's is a regional sort of uh, Chipotle-esque. Uh, yeah, it's like Mexican all the, all the Chipotle without any of the salmonella. It's pretty good. <laughs> Although I don't eat at Sharky's because I got a giant shard of glass in my food once. And so I've always now referred to it as Shardy's. Mm, but not Shardy's, which is what <laughs> no, I would that's, refer. That's that, that's that would be a, a, uh, an excellent name for Chipotle. Ooh, this episode of the 20, of <laughs> this episode of the, of the cinematography <laughs> podcast is brought to you by Chipotle. Anyway, um, won't be using that. Anyway, <laughs> you can... Uh, be assured now that Chipotle will not sponsor us. It's true. <laughs> it's true. So, so Ben, uh, tell me about the war story this week. Uh, today's war story is Roman Vasinov. He is the DP of Suicide Squad. Last year's Suicide Squad, big like I think one of the biggest hits in the in the DC Comics universe. Yeah, it was, it was really big. Yeah, yeah, looks great. And he works with David Ayer, who is I think that's how you pronounce his yeah, name. I think so too. Uh, he, who did um, Fury and End of Watch and lots of cool stuff. And uh, we've talked about End of Watch on this show before too, I believe, or at least I thought we may have had some banter about it. But God, what a great looking movie! And the night sequences and mm-hmm. like End of Watch are particularly uh, well. Anyway, if you haven't seen End of Watch, it's a great looking movie. You well, should totally watch it. In the next episode, Roman will talk at great depth about that. I, I must admit that when I met Roman, he's like 31 years old or something like that. And I was like, son of a bitch. Like, you know, like I was pissed <laughs> off because a young guy is like working at like the top of the business. And then I met and then after talking to him, it's like that guy's probably got more man hours behind a camera than most 55 year olds. Oh, yeah. He's got a he's got a fantastic story about going through film school and working in the going uh, through a film school that only Americans only wish they could uh, yeah. be abused by like I mean, like the level the level of instruction that he got. And that is in the next episode. Uh, just blew my mind. And yeah. And when you meet him in like 10 seconds, you understand that he's a master of this game and he is a master of, of what he does. And he is super confident and with, with totally deserves to be the guy is very sharp and age yeah. has nothing to do with that. No, no, he's brilliant. Brilliant. So I shouldn't be a reverse ageist <laughs> reversed ages. Is that a thing? Uh, it is now. <laughs> so anyway, here's the war story from Roman Vasyanov. And now war stories. Funny enough, my first war story <laughs> happened on my project End of Watch in, in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, it was like a sunny day and we were shooting in the neighborhood in South LA. We were shooting a crack house, which actually was an actual crack house. And uh, on a certain point, uh, David Ayer came to me and said, Hey man, I want to move that scene from a car in a grocery store just across the street. Can you go like, check it out? Like, What kind of a lighting you want to use there so we can after lunch shoot there? I said, sure. And I take my gaffer, Chris Carlton, with me, and we're walking, and over there, it's like one of those mornings when electricians put lights, and it's still like not in a rush, so we still have like 15 minutes to walk in the, 
grocery store and work in the grocery store and we come up in the grocery store and say, okay, let's put 18K over there and then 18K. And then I turn around and see a police guy standing. And we increase like, hey man, like because we're so used to it, we should, you know, more about police was have police with us. And then the guy turned to us and said, get down. I was like, what? Get down on the floor. What? Get down on the floor right now. And we're realizing that we're in the middle of actually FBI operation <laughs> in the South Central Los Angeles. <laughs> so basically we lay down on the floor and like it was like guy with a gigantic gun and they catch two guys behind the grocery store for drugs. And it's almost like a shootout started, but we basically were locked in that grocery store for like half an hour. And then they were being gone. And then we're like, okay, it's time to go back to set. And we show up like, guys, where you been? I said, well, David, we just been across the street in the middle of a police operation. So then I realized that actually, like the gangsters are exist, not in just uh, hip hop music videos, which I saw in Russia, they real. So that was my war story. <laughs> And now, short ends. All right, so that was Roman Vasyanov. Thank you, Roman, for coming out and uh, being a part of it. And in our next episode, we will feature a full interview with Roman Vasyanov. I'm looking forward to it. It's pretty damn cool. So, uh, Ilya, what is your short end today? Well, uh, in addition to all the traveling I'm doing, I also took a couple of days and I went to Vegas and went to the CES convention, which was... Jesus Christ. I know. it's the January's been crazy. I've been actually like in LA in the office, like eight days, the rest has been travel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you that CES is a wonder. If you're not familiar with CES, it's the consumer electronics show. It is the largest convention in this country. Uh, it gets way over a hundred thousand people who arrive in Las Vegas and it's all Wait, the big bigger than comic-con. Yeah. I mean, it's like, wow. it, it's way more square footage and it's way more people. And that's actually the thing about comic-con there. They want to move it from San Diego. Although well, they signed this deal. It's mm. uh, yeah, it's they, they've outgrown that space. So I feel sorry for the people going to Comic-Con. It is packed in like sardines. But what I want to talk about is 8K. My short end this week is 8K. 8K is something that is going to get some press. It's something that you're going to hear about. There are already a couple of cameras that shoot in 8K. Well, 8K television screens are coming to you and you're going to probably go like, you know, HD, 2K, 4K, 6K, 8K. When is this going to end? Never is the answer. Never. Incorrect. It is going to end at 8K. Really? Yeah. I, I well, and in a meaningful way, it is going to end at 8K. And, and here's why the limiting factor for resolutions beyond 4K really end and 8K is your eyes. And there was yeah. a lot of different manufacturers. Stupid human eyes. <laughs> Well, there, there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of uh, hay that's going to be made about 8K and 4K, although in this country, somewhat less than in places like Japan, which is very big on, on 8K. Uh, when you are standing about six feet from an 8K screen and a 4K screen, they look identical. When you move up, you know, five feet, four feet, they still look identical. Well, what about for like theatrical projection, though? Yeah, it, it's going to stay for it's going to stay for I saw an 8K projection demonstration at NAB probably 3 years ago and yeah. I believe it was called Ultra High Vision or mm -hmm. Super High Vision. Yeah. And uh I remember thinking like, yeah, that is pretty high res although they chose to go interlaced so it was like, wow, that's the as That's the television news. Yeah, it's, high res, it's yeah. super assy looking very high resolution. A lot of the earliest 8K cameras to the ones that were used for that uh very proprietary hand built individual things i know hitachi made one large large imaging imaging sensors custom lenses custom everything they were about the resolution they weren't necessarily about dynamic range and all the other stuff we are getting into a world right now where the limiting factor is your eyes to see a difference between the different k's and as a matter of fact if you are standing or sitting far enough away from your screen uh, standard definition looks like imax it has exactly the same apparent resolution even though it's wildly different actual rasters and different i want uh, everyone to send their emails complaining about that to Ilya. go on Ilya. It, but it's absolutely true and if you are in an imax screen and you are far enough back if you go to see like imax and i mean real imax not the limax Ooh. fake versions of that <laughs> you, you know what you everyone i who, love the term limax anyone who's who's familiar with it with this will know what i'm talking about but a, a true imax screen you're never sitting more than like 
a screen height away. You are right up on that screen, even in the back row. They do that because they want you to have that impact. They want you to have, have you know, see what's going on. Mm-hmm. The way that most people sit in their living rooms and the distances from their screens, they're really far away from their screens and you cannot discern a difference at the distance that most people sit. You got to be right up on it. So I would say that the difference between the best 8K screen available right now and the best 4K screen available right now right next to each other you don't see a difference until you are closer than about two and a half and and you're saying it's like like even a connoisseur if you have eyeballs made out of human dna you're just not going to be able to perceive much of a difference correct you you will see it if you get right up on it but if you are sitting back at any sort of normal distance five feet six feet you cannot see it with your eyes. Okay, so let me ask you something, and this is something we haven't discussed before, so I'm a, I may have to edit this out because because the answer might be unsatisfactory to both of us. But uh, what's the next arms race after we top out at 8K, and and you know they're selling uh, you know DSLR sized cameras for six hundred dollars that shoot 8K eventually or whatever. Uh, what's the next arms race? What's what's the next uh, what's the next frontier for cameras? Well, you're going to see resolution for some time, but what it's going to be is not writing a file size that's large. You're not going to have a 20k sensor writing a 20k file size. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the 20k sensor writing the 8k or the 4k, and. It's pretty clear roadmap from all the manufacturers that I've talked to that 8K is a real thing. Red's got an 8K. Sony's got an 8K. Uh, you know, the new GH5 camera, which is announced, has a 6K sensor in it, but it's only recording to 4K. Yeah. What you're going to see is sensors that are high resolution oversampling. Oversampling is an old, is an older term. Actually, the first time I think I remember seeing it was CD players back when the, the dawning of digital, you know, more yeah. samples than, than you actually need per se so what's happening is that you're going to have a sensor that's going to be 8k or 18k but your file is still going to be 4k you get a lot of the benefit due to something called nyquist theory which if you need a cure for insomnia you can read on wikipedia you know is this related to sven nyquist it is as a matter of fact so uh, and the the nyquist um uh, and it's it's funny because actually it's nyquist hyphen and i can't remember i can't remember the other person but there's two people now have the sampling theory which basically says like the more times you sample something that they the more accurate dis, dis, the more accurate representation you can create so for example mm. like the, the best way i can explain sampling is that if you lived in a cave and you only walked out of that cave once a day at noon you have a and if you only go out at noon all the time you have a very different picture of the world than if you'd gone out at one a at one o'clock in the morning or anything this else. This is but taking the, such a turn for the esoteric. I can't wait to. Well, I can't wait to read up on this. Uh, <laughs> so, so here's the thing. You, now you've changed. You're, you've got one sample. You go out of your cave at noon. Mm-hmm. You see the world. You go out twice. You go out at noon and at midnight. Your version of the world is completely different. Imagine now if you're going out once an hour, you get an even better picture of the world. If you just are constantly leaving your cave and looking to see what's happening, you have a very clear picture of the world. That is what sampling is. It's taking a sample more and more more and more times and so if you've got this high resolution with a whole lot of samples and you scale this down you're still receiving a large portion of the a a large part of the benefits the same thing with film it's why film looks like film even on standard def you can take a 4k kodak original camera negative scan that at high resolution show it on standard def television and it still looks like film it didn't lose the qualities of film Hmm. does that make sense Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> okay. I think I just lost like ninety percent of our listeners right now. But, but I, I, by by the chance that I I didn't, I just want to say my my short end this week is eight k. And as much as it's going to be shoved down your throats, it's not something that you really have to freak out about. It's not something you have to really pay that much attention to, because four k upscaled to eight k looks so much better than HD upscaled to eight k. And four k and eight k are so similar in so many different ways. And the limiting factor is your eyes and nothing else. Well. I also just want to say something here too. Uh, I I have a film called Future Boyfriend that's been doing the festival circuit recently. It played Tribeca last year and uh, premiered at Tribeca, and it was shot on the Red Epic. And I believe we shot it on a 4K Epic. I don't believe it was a 6K Epic. Uh, no, it might have been a 6K. Anyway, we delivered an HD file, mm-hmm. and that's what screened at every festival on the big screen. And you know, we saw it. I saw it at, at multiple festivals, often against uh, 4K stuff. And it looked fine. The the talent of the person shooting is way more important than the resolution of your camera. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, yeah, you absolutely can't argue with that. And George Foyt, who shot that, is an amazing cinematographer. 
Um, but I also feel like, you know, uh, like the, something has to be said for the quality of the digital projection that we have going on, which, yeah, which has improved, you know, outrageously over the last 10 years. It's, it's very interesting. And there will continue to be this arms race of technology and high dynamic range and other things will be, uh, yeah. will be, you know, battleground. High for, dynamic range seems like a fun thing, a fun fight to have. Like I, I, that would be a thing that would convince me to get a camera, one camera over another. And, and that being said too, really, if you've got, if you've got 12 to 14 stops at dynamic range, you have a very high dynamic range camera oh, yeah. that right now. Uh, if you have less than 12 stops and really, I think the the really high dynamic range stuff starts around 13 or 14, but, uh, if you have less than 12, that's going to be consumer stuff. That's going to be your cell phone. I think yeah. in the very near future, all cameras are going to have that sort of level of dynamic range. And it's going to be, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens. <laughs> wow. That's, that's fascinating. Okay. So, uh, that's crazy. Okay. So what's, what's your, your short end this week? Um, uh, my short end is, uh, shooting in VR. Oh, okay. Um, so my web series uh, that I co-created with Bob DeRosa and it's produced by Kat Paziak. It's called 20 Seconds to Live. I talk about it nonstop on here. Can you watch it at 20secondstolive.com? You can actually go to 20secondstolive.com right now and you can watch it. You can also watch it at aeriscope.com. Um, and uh, we have been kicking around the idea for over a year of doing an episode uh, for virtual reality. And uh, let me just tell you, shooting virtual reality complete learning curve like it was like learning how to shoot film from the ground up all over again um and it's because like in my mind i was uh, you know it was like oh it'll be like shooting it'll be like theater because the audience can look wherever they want to look and that really was kind of my thinking and i direct a lot of theater so you know to me i wasn't really that scared off by it and the actors that we work with tend to be people with a lot of theater experience so they weren't scared off by it it was like hey it's actually going to be kind of easier for you guys because you just get to do it all in one go Uh, some things that you know we didn't really consider at first now one of the smart things that i think we did was we were able and i have to give a lot of credit to tims johnson at blacklist digital tims has developed a vr camera system of his own that shoots with four 4k cameras arranged in a circle uh each camera is oriented nine by 16 so sideways with a very fisheye lens and you shoot it all in one go and it records to some recorder that's that's based on the on the camera itself. And then uh, he uh, a guy named Tom Moser, who's also a friend of mine who works over at Blacklist Digital, he stitches the stuff together first. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I could write a dissertation about the the shit that I learned. But we uh, Tim's was willing to let us come in and do a couple rehearsals. So we did two rehearsals with the actors. And in between, we ended up rewriting the piece because we realized like Bob would write like a quippy piece of dialogue and in a conventional shoot you would just cut to the guys saying the smart ass comment right and we realized that if you weren't already looking there that you would have no reason to look at the guy saying the wise ass comment ever so he would say it and everybody would look at him and then you'd look at him afterwards and be like well what what and so we rewrote it and in fact cut out a whole character um, wow. c- cause it was like, yeah, that character isn't really adding anything and, and it's, it's kind of detracting and, and you know, and, and it's confusing. And, uh, what we did too, is we shot the thing in virtual reality and normally. So it was two separate days to shoot. The first day was VR. The second day was the conventional shoot. And, um, it was, uh, just so many, so many lessons to, to learn, you know, basically you're lighting the whole thing at once if you shoot in VR. Uh, so, so now you're you're done with post, right? So no, I'm in the middle of post on the VR episode. We've already cut the conventional version because I'm um, uh, drawn towards things that make me comfortable, and I'm comfortable editing conventional stuff. Okay, so you, you happy with a conventional cut? Yeah, very happy. From what you've done so far with the VR, do you think you will be equally happy, or you think you'll be less happy? Do you? Th- I mean, it was designed and conceived initially for VR, right? So- yeah, this episode Bob wrote specifically for VR. Um, I think it's going to be interesting. I think that part of it's, it's, it's so hard to compare. Like, again, I've been sort of saying that it was going in. I kept saying to myself, it's going to be like theater. It's going to be like theater. And really it's just as different from theater as film is from theater and theater is from film. And it's just that as different from film as it is from, from those things as well. It's such a different mindset to be in. And moreover, there's kind of uh, a huge debate going on in in the community of people who want to see a lot of VR content about like what even VR content is going to look like. Is it all going to be interactive? Because this won't be interactive. You'll be able you'll be able to 
interact with it in that you'll be able to look around wherever the hell you want to look around, but you're not going to be able, it's not, you're not controlling the story. It's not a choose your own adventure story. Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, it was worth, it was worth kind of rolling the dice for us. Um, also miking became a, a huge issue just because you had to do everything with lavalier mics. Mm, I, I'd have to imagine. Yes. Because you <laughs> see, you see everywhere. You see, you see everywhere. Yeah, exactly. When you roll, the, when you roll the camera, you literally see everywhere. Now that being said, you can do pickups hmm. if you're clever and in the episode that we wrote, uh, Bob wrote a convention where the lights flicker. Mm. Um, and so that gave us cut points. And that was very helpful. Um, I can just see now a hundred different VR films, all with flickering lights. So. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I sort of feel like I think Joss Whedon said, you know, like play all your big cards first because it makes you have to be more creative and think of better cards. And it, and it was one of those things where it's like, well, we have no cut points. And I forget who I think it was Bob who said, like, well, what if what if, you know, when X happens, the, the lights, lights go flicker. out? Yeah. And it was like, oh, cool. And not only did that make it like for a scarier thing in general, but it also was like, oh, that means that we can cut out because we have, you know, makeup changes and effects and stuff like that but what that also meant was we could pick up somebody like if we like we had an actor um who had to leave he had a hard out and of course we were running late because that's what you do and um so we shot his angle out first because it's four cameras mm-hmm. so you're shooting his camera of the four out first oh well, you know I'll, I'll tell you of course i was at ces vr or sorry vr vr very big again uh at the convention vr big topic of discussion at nappy vr is sort of everywhere right now but i think that most of the people who are talking about it have never produced it and it's very interesting that that now that you've produced it and have this perspective and it is a polarizing conversation there's a lot of interest there's money behind it there's venture capital being poured into vr right now but at the same time, I meet a, a, a certain segment of people who go, it's a terrible experience. I hate the goggles. The goggles are super low res. It's not, it doesn't. Uh, the gogg- none of the goggles are any good yet. That's true. I mean, like the best goggles you can get in two years are going to be laughably shitty. It would be like, you know, if, if, if we went from no television to black and white television to high def television in three steps, that's kind of what's going to have to happen. Uh, there are high quality screens that can be used for this, but no one wants to pay the money. It'll cost like $12,000 if you want a good VR headset and everyone wants one that's under 300 bucks. So this is, that's that's the whole thing. Yeah. I mean like right now I think the highest end one and the best stuff I've seen has been done for the HTC Vive. And uh, like at, at, at uh, Tribeca there was, we saw some stuff that was done on the Vive and it was pretty impressive. But uh, at the same time, you know, it's like to get an HTC Vive, I think, is an eight hundred dollar headset. Plus, you need to get a pretty high end PC to run it. So you're probably looking at, you know, a eh, thirty five hundred dollar investment to watch some VR. I mean, unless you already have a high end um, PC that would work for this. And so, you know, it's it's an investment. It's and it, it's an investment that may or may not pay off in the like no i'm not gonna say it's not gonna pay off i'm saying nobody knows where this stuff is headed so it could go in more interesting ways and become something that people love or it could end up being something that you know five years from now and this is what i kept saying to everyone we were getting ready to do our episode is like five years from now we might be like how ridiculous of it uh, of us was it to try it but at the same time why create something like 20 seconds to live and not just use it as a sandbox i i think that every filmmaker every beginning filmmaker if i was to give them one piece of advice it's like come up with some kind of sandbox style web series that you can just try shit out on because if because if one episode flops who cares like this is about taking calculated risks but risks yeah i think that i think that that experimentation is very alive and well sort of in the the youtube uh yeah the youtube channels that are well you know it's interesting i heard a i heard a really great statistic which was 95% 95% of the traffic from YouTube comes from 1% of the content. <laughs> so, which, which to me is just like, that's, yeah, that's mine. Doesn't blowing. surprise me. I don't know. I mean, total sidetrack, but like PewDiePie, when he was, uh, uh, threatening to, you're not threatening, promising to delete his channel if he got 50 million subscribers. And then he did get 50 million subscribers and then said, psych, I'm not deleting my channel. Are you guys crazy? And you know, it's like 50 million people want to watch him play video games and make mildly smart ass comments. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, 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 uh, and it, it's interesting because, um, there's a lot of people who are trying to figure out what that means to traditional media. And there are other people, nothing who just, is what that means to and, traditional and, media. That's exactly correct. And I believe that that is going to be finally established here shortly that 
YouTube is not replacing traditional media or not television, but that, I mean, this has been the, the thought process from a lot of people and, and how this is working because, oh, the eyeballs aren't on TV. Now they're on YouTube. Um, YouTube is just something else. The market yeah. has grown. It hasn't been replaced. It hasn't been usurped. Correct. Uh, but even at the, even in like the halls of Natby, when people are talking about it, it's like there's some thought process of like, well, how do we take these people and move them from their platform into this other platform and take that 50 million people with them? And the people who have tried that have not been very successful. So that's uh, that's yeah. interesting. I uh, I was up to direct. I probably told you about this off the mic at some point, but I was I was being considered to direct a movie for Smosh mm. um, last summer, and Smosh has like thirty million subscribers, and they do I think you know pretty decent material. It's mostly sketch comedy ish stuff oriented to towards tweens, but they've made two movies and this is their second movie. Just to put this in perspective, Smosh has the same number of subscribers as the population of Canada. Yeah. That's crazy when you put it that way. But it's true. It's yeah. like everyone in Canada is watching Smosh. That is like that's that's yeah. the same number of people. And that is what kind of has the television and the traditional advertising industry so but you know, up in arms. But here's what's interesting about it. So they made a feature that Alex Winter directed that came out last year just called Alex. called yeah. the called the Smosh movie. Oh really? Do you know Alex? I, I don't, but I, just, I love his work. And you yeah. know who does know him is Mike Mickens, who's been oh. a friend of the show. Oh nice. And I mentioned before how much I love Alex Winter, and he's like, oh yeah, I, I, like he knows him from way back. So oh, that's uh, weird. I know one other person who knows Alex. So much. Anyway, but yeah, so they made that movie and I don't know how well that did. And then this one was made for YouTube Red. Mm. What I think is interesting about all this is that my friend who used to work for Maker Studios, uh, his name is Chad Saley, and he was telling me probably six, seven years ago how like these kids who watch YouTube and he's my age, so we can sit here and say ju- kids, say yeah. kids. It's all not that. derogatory. They really are kids. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, like the average YouTube viewer, I don't know if the statistics have changed, but traditionally is like a 14 year old. Yeah. Uh, he said that they didn't care about television. They didn't care about movies. They didn't care about anything. They just wanted to get everything through YouTube. What I think is interesting is that YouTube for whatever reason is trying to grow that up. And I think they're also trying to create a different revenue stream. And so they've created YouTube red, which is in fact an SVOD platform. Mm -hmm. So you pay for YouTube red. You don't have to have commercials on any of your YouTube videos and moreover stuff like this movie that I, that I did not direct, (laughs) but was considered for, uh, which is called ghost mates. And I recommend everybody check it out. Uh, ghost mates was made exclusively for YouTube red and they're starting to do that. So they're trying to say like, how do we take our talent who are people who've been nurtured, who actually made YouTube what it is. How do we take them and make movies with them? And it, and it, it is interesting. And I think from a cinematography standpoint, what's interesting too, is they're trying to make these things look like real movies. Now they're not, uh, the, the aesthetic of YouTube, I think started in a very interesting way, like a funny or die kind of a thing and has slowly evolved to being more and more slick and more professional people like rocket jump, Freddie Wong, those guys are moving into the TV space. And I think that what ends up happening this is my opinion is that, you know, you're smosh and you know, those guys started when they were 18. Now they're closing in on 30. I think they're 29 or 30 years old. And it's like, they want to do more mature work. They want to do, I don't think they want to stop doing what they're doing, but I think they want to figure out a way to reach an old, an audience of their current peers now. Well, th- this is really interesting. This is something also that, uh, I've had a couple of, I've had this discussion a couple of times and one person who I met last week, their their basic rebuttal to all of this was that those same YouTube creators, the first chance they get, a lot of them, I'm not saying across the board, and some of them do want to stay on YouTube and keep doing what they're doing, but a lot of them, the first chance they get to sell out, they want to take. They want a traditional linear media. They want a traditional linear media. Yes, exactly. They want a traditional broadcast. I'm going to go pitch to some linear media. You you totally could linear media, mm. which is, you know, uh, television broadcast cable. I just, all of that. I hate so, the, I hate the, the businessy double speak, but you know, it's just me. You know what? I don't hate linear. It's, it's feel like it's pretty descriptive. It's like, as if like, there's a lot of industry double speak and there's a lot of like catchphrases. It's and all linear though. If you're making a series, if you're making black mirror for Netflix, that's still linear. It, like, you're still making a actually it's not because it's on netflix you can choose to watch episode seven if you decide to and not episode one and yes you could if you had a dvr and you're getting it over the cable you could let your dvr load up seven episodes and then choose seven but technically linearly you had to wait for all of those to come and most not all but most of the platforms are doing the binge style where here you go blah they've regurgitated an entire season all at once and you can pick whatever you want to watch i mean like you know, HBO doesn't do that necessarily, but now with things like HBO Go, they still don't do that. 
No, I know they don't, they don't, they release their shows week by week, but how many, sh- like, I can't speak for everybody else, but like I found Silicon Valley two seasons in and binge two seasons in like two days. Anyway, but we're, we're talking about semantics and it's, it really, I, I don't have a big problem with the word linear mm-hmm. as a descriptive. I mean, it's, it's not bad. I, I understand what the intention was and yes, it's just, it's, it's yet the latest term to try to distinguish the old standard from the new, but yes, anyway, these YouTubers, the first chance they can, the first, these Instagram stars, the first chance they can, they want to get something that is on broadcast or they want to get something that's yeah, in the yeah. theaters. And you know, you know, it's, uh, hey, I don't blame any of them. It, uh, yeah, I don't blame any of them either. But it, what I think is really interesting is that what you do on a YouTube platform may not translate to those other platforms. Well, I don't think YouTube's figured that out. And I think that the rest of traditional media has kind of figured that out, that what you're doing may not necessarily you can't pull your audience necessarily. They're not going to follow you. And making, you know, comments about video games is not the same. As well, yeah, there won't. Show. There probably will be a PewDiePie movie if there hasn't been already. Oh, okay. But I do think that a lot of uh, YouTube personality stuff personality driven stuff is like people feel like they like there's a very popular one called my drunk kitchen and Mm -hmm. again they probably could try and make a movie out of that but i feel like it's kind of uh, it's a doomed proposition that would only work if it worked accidentally because uh uh because because the entire thing about it is that you're creating a a personal connection with the person on the other end of the media and these people interact with their fans a lot. And, that, and, and so it's like, why would I go to a movie theater and watch so-and-so Two hours? You why could, you why am I going to go to a movie theater and watch Ilya Friedman perform in something when I can just hang out with him when he's my friend and I know him. And I think it's like one step removed from that for a lot of these people. And you know, I think you're right. But I mean, at the same time, like, you know, you look at somebody like Freddie Wong or you look at people like Smosh and you go, well, you know, these guys are actually doing the work and maybe they could break out into a bigger audience. And if a bigger audience had had an opportunity, it'd be interesting to see if they could, you know, if they could like they're talented enough and they know what they're doing and they have a thing that they do. I agree. And it's great if you can motivate that fan base and you can convince them to go follow you to Apple TV and download something or to a theater to go watch something. And maybe Smosh has had some success with that. There's a lot of other people who have tried this and not had the success in a traditional standpoint. But yeah, there was the guy who made the... uh, the, made the social media star movie and yeah. made 75 million overnight with the, you know, downloads. I mean, it, it does happen. I think it was yeah. novelty. I don't, I don't think that's a repeatable bankable formula that you can do over and over again. Well, yeah. And I think that, you know, what you and I are often talking about when we're talking about cinematography is like, what is art? And I, and it's not to say that what anyone's doing on YouTube isn't art. It's not to say that PewDiePie isn't making art. Uh, although I do in, in, like in, when I'm watching it, I really do know how my dad felt when I was playing rap music for him when I was, you know, 15 years old, you know, I'm like, I, I just fail to understand it, but that's just, that's, that's on me. <laughs> that's my failure to understand. That's I, it's okay for me to not be entertained by something. And it's great for someone else to be thoroughly entertained by the same thing. I don't really give a shit, but, um, <laughs> but, I, but I, I do think it's an interesting evolution. Of course, like, you know, I think that, Ultimately, the next Orson Welles could pop out of that world. And you don't know. You don't know where they're going to come from. You you don't know where the next master is going to come out of. Totally. I, I agree 100%. And, you know, and, and this is, uh, I don't know, this is such a such a rat hole that we're going down. But I'm okay with this. And I think that we should put this in the podcast. Um, Me too. Um, but, uh, you know, when we were talking about this earlier, you know, there's kind of a mindset, I think, amongst our generation, Generation X, Generation X. Yeah. Um, the that uh, that we need to make feature films, feature films, 90 minute feature length played in movie theater films. And I think that that's just one outlet. Now, there's multiple outlets and there's multiple ways that you can uh, there's multiple ways you can get stuff out. And one of the reasons I chose to do a web series in a lot of ways was uh, if I make a feature film, I'm not in control of does someone buy it? I'm not in control of how somebody markets it. And even though there's like no money at all in doing a web series for me at the moment, um, I'm in completely control of how it gets made about who is in it. Like basically Bob and cat and myself are we're the three we're we decide everything that happens in that thing. And so, you know, we, we get to try whatever we want to try, nix whatever we want to nix, keep whatever we want to keep. And then we decide when and how it's released and we decide how we bring it out to the world. And, you know, we don't have a marketing budget, but that's OK, you know. And to me, that's a more exciting proposition than working for two years on a project that may or may not ever see the light of day. 
you know, you hear about people who make movies for like Blumhouse and then they get shelved and you're like, oh boy, that, that can't be good. Not just Blumhouse. There's lots of people out there who make movies that then just never see the light of day. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's, um, that's one of the real hazards if you're going to go into the feature film business. You know, I, I actually don't think it's just Generation X that has this obsession with must make. No, I know films, younger people who are into it and, and older people too. It's like, yeah. I think it's kind of universal, you know, the, the the strata of prestige and media feature films have always kind of had this this upper level i know in the agencies you know, feature films are not the most per, you know profitable center of the business they do but it's the most prestigious the yeah. oscar is the most prestigious award because you're kind of playing in this like you know texas hold them no, no limits sort of like hey it's a you're rolling the dice you're going for it yeah. you're going to make a feature and you know the balls to the wall you are you're you're going for it and you could have a tremendous amazing fantastic like look at look at the success that is it that barry jenkins is having with moonlight right now mm-hmm. uh, i mean it's like that was a relatively i mean granted it's plan b and everything else it's like it's not a, a small project but it's a relatively small project that is it's a modest project being backed by some big people it, it is but i mean it's getting a lot of love. It's getting a lot of, I, I still haven't seen it. So, but uh, I have the screener and I haven't watched it yet. And, I, and it's one of those ones that I keep circling, but uh, you know, like it, within the feature film world, like, you know, we have this, you know, we get all these Oscar screeners and one of the ones that was edge of 17. I liked it. Actually. I liked it. And I, but I was watching it and I was like, I wonder if like the Marvel executives are watching this and being like, what, what superhero do we need to give her to direct? <laughs> Like, like, I really feel like that's the only feature film business is like Star Wars, Marvel, DC to a lesser degree, and the occasional other spectacular like Jurassic Park or a King Kong spinoff. Yeah, that's you. You basically summarized it. We could have another King Kong movie coming shortly. Skull Island, which yeah. uh, was, I believe, also uh, Tony Libertori worked on. Oh, that's right. It all comes back around. So that's a great place to leave it. Oh, well, actually, the place to leave it is they used some Hot Rod Cameras products for their location scouting. Nice. And, you know, our sponsor of the show, Hot Rod Cameras. Uh, this episode anyway, our, our, <laughs> our, our ongoing exclusive sponsor. sponsor. Yes. And you know, sponsor hot rod cameras, uh, can help you with all of your camera related needs and things, any accessories that would go with a camera, lighting, grip, anything professional, anything, you know, what, what kind of cameras did they use on skull Island? Actually don't know. Well, we only helped them for their scouting stuff. Oh, so. well, what kind of cameras did they use for their scouting for skull Island? Uh, they use the Sony a seven S with a hot rod cameras, PL mount and some anamorphic lenses and some other stuff. Well, you could shoot a real movie on that. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's a, that's real movie rig right there. You could, you absolutely could. And certainly all of their location scouting was supposedly done with our setup. So excellent. Well, uh, excellent. Well, I'm glad that we got to plug. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad I got to like shoehorn that plug in. I think this is the first plug that I've actually spoken in the first 12 episodes. And I'm sorry it took two years to get to 12 episodes, but I'm so glad we're here. I totally had a goal of more than six last year, but we we did another six. <laughs> so. <laughs> and the sad thing is, uh, don't we have like 27 in the can right now? And I just need to. Edit I don't know them. how many it is, but it's it's. It's I, more than three. I, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, we definitely have Roman Vasyanov, uh, Rodney Charters, Christian Seabalt. That's right. Those are those those three for sure. And then there was that fellow that you interviewed that I wasn't there for. And I have the file. But I oh, yes, that, that's right. Uh, George Diaz Amador. And that's going to be sort of like a new format thing for us, too. I'm going to take the reins at some of these uh, these interviews and do um, some technical discussions for people who want that technical sort of stuff and they want to go down that rabbit hole. We'll put a, some sort of disclaimer. that that's Yeah, the why not? Is. Yeah. I mean, we, we have access to some of the brightest and sharpest technical minds in Hollywood. We should put them on the podcast. Yes. I think it, it makes sense. Makes total sense. So uh, tune in sometime in 2018 for episode <laughs> 13 of the Cinematography Podcast. Or hopefully next week <laughs> so. well yeah well this one will be up next week All right. anyway thank you very much for listening and uh, we hope to uh... signing off thanks for listening <laughs> this has been the cinematography podcast presented by hot rod cameras find your next camera lens or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com don't forget to subscribe to our show on itunes and connect with us on facebook and twitter thanks for listening thanks for listening